And you are okay. live. We are live. All right. Um, uh, quorum being present, this meeting of the Annapolis Historic Preservation Commission uh, for the 13th of April shall come to order. The commission operates pursuant to the land use article of the annotated code of the state of Maryland. Local authority for the commission is derived from municipal code of the city of Annapolis chapter 21, section 56. The purpose of the HPC is to preserve sites, structures and districts of historical, cultural, archeological and architectural significance. Requirements for serving on the commission are detailed in section 21, uh, chapter 21, section 8.06. The HPC operates pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act and therefore no pending application shall be discussed among or between commissioners outside the public hearing or uh, to determine the disposition of the application. All right, um, that was our first agenda item. Our second agenda item is roll call. Uh, Bill Williams is here. Kim Finch. Here. Uh, Bobby Collins. Here. Will Scott. Here. And Tim Leahy, I am the chair. I serve as chair. Uh, Bobby, Bobby is our vice chair. Also staff, Roberta Lehner, Chief of Historic Preservation is with us. Here. Uh, John Tower, the Assistant Chief of Historic Preservation is with us. Here. Uh, we also have Joelle Braithwaite from the Office of Law and Cheryl Wood, uh, who is um, assigned from the Office of Law to be su uh, legal support for the commission. Our, uh, our recorder is Ms. Tammy Hook. Who's really in charge. She's in charge. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, Jackie Rouse, I can see, has just joined us too. She is with Planning and Zoning, and she is very welcome. Uh, also, supporting staff. Uh, the commission is authorized to require an oath in order to testify. This is done on mass. I'm going to waive this e this evening since we actually are not going to be taking any formal testimony this evening. Yep, thank you. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is announcements. Actually, I don't have any. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to create an announcement. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Next on our agenda is approval of minutes. Up for approval are the appro uh, February 25th. Are there any um, uh, edits or changes to the uh, minutes for February 25th? Um, I have one small one, Tammy. It's a, a kind of a trick. Um, during that meeting, we had Robert Clark and Anthony Clark Robert Clark's name does not have an E at the end of it. Um, so when you referred to him in the minutes um, several times, you, you just want to drop the E off. And we may want to say Robert Clark at that point, because a little, little, little bit later we say Mr. Clark uh, under the discussion of the umbrellas over Maryland Avenue, you might want to put Anthony Clark in front of that just so we know who's talking. Okay, you, is, is that clear, Tammy? Yes, okay. it is. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll take a motion to approve uh, the minutes for February 25th, 2021. So moved. Second. 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 Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All abstain? All right. The minutes for February 25th are approved. All right. Uh, next up is approval of minutes for March 9th. Any edits or changes to those minutes? Okay, motion. I move that we approve the meeting minutes for March 9th, 2021. A second. A second motion. Okay, that was Will. Or yeah, both that Will. Was Bill. Okay, Great. Bill. Uh, okay, really Tammy. Yep. One of the um, all right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstain? Okay, 
the minutes are approved. Okay. Um, Next on our agenda is new violations and status of any active violations. Over to Roberta and John, anything to report? Well, I actually don't remember if I stated this last meeting, but we did resolve a sign violation at uh, 57 West and uh, with uh, an application the number of signs. That's all I have to report. Okay. I'm getting, I'm having a little trouble hearing Roberta. Is it just me? Yeah. No. I am also. No, I'm, I have trouble. Oh. So we'll really? just keep, we'll keep note on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll just keep track of that, Roberta. We, you came through okay, but it, it's starting I, to wobble a little bit. I'm going to shut down the other computer, see if that helps. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, any um, any commissioners have any questions about violations in the historic district for this period? Okay. Um, next on the agenda is the consent docket. Uh, the consent docket is, it is a procedure designed to expedite certain applications before the commission. In order to be considered for the consent docket, the application must receive recommendation for approval or approval with minor conditions from all the city staff and the commission's technical advisors. Also, there needs to be no public opposition to the application. If the application is approved, uh, it does not need to testify further and the applicant is free to go, but please understand you still need to obtain the necessary permits. Uh, the following application is eligible for uh, the consent docket. It is 196 Duke of Gloucester Street uh, I believe um, Lynn Kraus is here representing, you are the owner, correct? Uh, so um, Mark, can you promote Lynn so he can be seen and, and uh, we can just update or give him information that's necessary for this? Yes, I've promoted him. Would you like uh, the others for that section promoted? Uh if there are others for that uh, application, yeah. That's one of the disadvantages. We don't know who is with which application, but anybody having to do with 196. Um, and Bobby, um, do you by chance have the staff report up that you could uh, read out the conditions? That would be great. Yes, I have it up right here. Um, conditional awesome. approval of the proposed project at 196 Gloucester Street. Um, it, it has all the... Um, uh, guidelines that is consistent with and the um, uh, the uh, things that they have to comply with are the following. Applicant shall schedule site meetings with Historic Preservation Division staff as, as details of the project evolve, including but not limited to restoration of windows, doors, wood trim, roof, decorative ironwork, exterior cleaning, and new installation for HVAC lighting and landscape. The second one is shop drawings for windows, millwork, and ironwork, as well as restoration protocols shall be submitted to HPD staff for final review and approval. Number three, necessary field meetings shall be scheduled with HPD staff before work commences and as work progresses. Number four, applicants shall submit some sample masonry samples to HPD staff for any repointing of original brickwork and also arrange for a site visit as work commences to ensure the technique will match the color texture and tooling of the original brickwork. And finally, applicants shall submit an HPC, HPC revision form for review and approval of all exterior changes not specifically approved with this application. HPC staff re reserves the right to request a public hearing for any revisions to the project. Okay. So um, I'm not sure who wants to speak on the application, um, but whoever does, do you accept those conditions on the approval? Oh, absolutely. Yes, sir. Okay. Great. Um, then uh, Roberta, you wanted to make a comment. So please do. Yes, and uh, stop me if uh, I'm, you're not hearing me very well. Um, so far so good. I, we hear you okay, fine. Okay, I turned off everything else. But we hear um, you very fine. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to say that this is a little bit different, um, uh, obviously, because there was a disastrous fire. Um, 
and the Prague Second Empire building includes a little bit of everything in historic preservation, um, including repairing uh, damaged finishes, uh, replicating uh, missing features, reconstruction of entire floors and framing, mm. uh, adaptive use, office to residential, and restoration of features um, with sufficient remaining evidence. And um, I uh, first want to thank the fire department for saving this building. Um, it could have had uh, another very different outcome um, with just a few more minutes uh, of uh, a fully engulfed building. Um, and the important fact here is that the building has been saved and um, the owners and architects uh, are working uh, very closely with us. And uh, because this is a project that is evolving and has to evolve, because of its condition, uh, we're approaching this a little differently, and that's why the conditions okay. um, are stated in the manner that they are, if, if that makes sense. And also, I just wanted to mention that um, I included uh, a long exterior description uh, of the historic description in the staff report, because I just want to point out the importance of uh, having a complete survey of a building in the historic district as opposed to just a one page survey. And um, our, our goal for the commission and the historic preservation division should someday uh, be able, enable us to have this type of uh, tracery survey uh, for every contributing building in the historic district. And this is why. Mm -hmm. Because if something like this happens, then we have uh, fantastic information about uh, what existed um, prior to the event. So I just wanted to uh, mention that to everyone. Yes. Yes, Will. Um, I just wanted to make a brief comment uh, related to what Roberta just shared with us. And that is, I want to thank all those who uh, contributed to providing that uh, excellent photographic documentation uh, that certainly made it easier to understand the extent of damage and the um, plans for uh, restoring and renovating the building much easier to um, make a decision with such wonderful back background material. So thank right. you. Thank yep. you. Great. Excellent work. Okay. Um, and just for the applicants, if they, I'm not sure you've ever been here, but the point of the consent document is we can we can ex expedite this. The main reason is it, it needs to we need to give the opportunity for public uh, public testimony, um, and that, that's why <coughs> we, we need to do the public office, even though we're going to go through a fairly uh, quick process here. So, okay, I'll take a motion to approve the consent docket. Uh, I move that we approve um, the application for 196 Duke of Gloucester Street because it's consistent with the guidelines mentioned in the staff report and the applicant has approved or has agreed to the conditional, uh, the conditions put on the application. Okay, a second, second please. That was well seconded. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All abstain? Okay. The consent docket, which just includes 196 Duke of Gloucester, is approved. So please go forward and help. Uh, thank you so much for thank you very much, so much for your Thank you, thank you, members thank of the you. commission. Thank you, Roberta. Thank hey you. Tim, I, I wanted to ask. Um, I know that um, that we generally do um, written um, testimony, but um, in this case, do we still go through the process of saying, you know, is there anybody in the audience that's in opposition? Do we still need to do that or no? No, uh, actually, okay. we we don't. We only are right now accepting written um, comments, and okay. um, right now we, we the audience is un, is just. Un I think he's frozen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Tim, if you can hear us, you might need to log off and log back on. Me? What? Tim. He, okay. He's um he's posing for his um 
wax statue. I just texted him, so we'll see if he comes back. What's that? I guess so. Yeah. Um, when, may we be excused then, um, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman? He'll be back in just a second. And yes, what he'll do yeah. is, oh, there he is. <coughs> there he is. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes, sir. Okay. Don't know what happened. Um, I was talking too long. <laughs> so, Tammy, did I, did I answer your question? You did. Thank uh, you very much. Uh, the question yes, was you may, you may go, Lynn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you sir. for everybody. Appreciate it. Yes. Okay. Um, next on our agenda is pre application. So, we have two of them this evening. Um, the first is uh, St. John's College, uh, Mellon Hall. So who is here to discuss that with us? And Mark, could you promote them? Oh, hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Allie. Hi, Tim. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. How are you? Good. And it looks, Jim. So what, I'll, what, what we'll, we'll do um, is as we go through this, um, the, um, the, the pre-application is, is, is uh, a more informal, for those of you who have never been here, some of you have, might have been here before, I know Allie has. Um, uh, it is a, um, a, a, a informal design review and, and, and provides the applicant with uh, feedback on potential guidelines that need to be uh, addressed. Um, and the feasibility of the application itself. And in, in no way should it be construed as approval or disapproval in any way, uh, because after the final application is uh, submitted, staff has a formal review of it. And, uh, and then, then we actually, it becomes more formal. So I just wanna let you know. Um, do you understand the, these conditions uh, of the pre-application? Yes. Yes, okay. So Tammy, they're all nodding their heads. <laughs> so um, you've got quite a gang here. Um, there, please feel free to whoever's leading, introduce yourself and your roles. And then uh, we all have all had the opportunity to review your designs uh, in advance. And um, so what, tell us who's leading the conversation and introduce yourselves and then tell us what you'd like to, us to know. Certainly. Uh, my name is Gregory Haas. I am a principal from David M. Schwartz Architects in Washington, D.C. Um, we are part of the design team that St. John's has hired to work on this project. Um, and I think somebody's going to pull up a presentation, correct? So that yes. I'm talking to something. Right. So as, as that's coming up, um, I'll introduce my colleague, Dean Reineking, who is also from my office at David M. Schwartz. He's going to be talking a bit later in, in this presentation as well as James Hall, who's with Kessel Architects, our associate architect in Annapolis. And as you saw, we also have uh, Ali Gontang Highfield here from the college, as well as uh, JR, are you here? JR Pappas with St. John's. Uh, first of all, I really do wanna thank uh, the HPC and in particular, um, Roberta Lehner and Jacqueline Rouse. Um, we, we've had some great conversations with both of them and they've been extremely helpful in helping us to focus on the issues um, that they believe are most important and, and helping guide us through some of the, the intricacies of, of those pieces. So thank you very much in advance. Um, also, I think we wanna say we're, we're very honored as a design team to contribute to St. John's College and the Annapolis community on this project. Um, and in particular to you know helping to maintain Mellon Hall as a vital working building um, that, that really serves both the college and the community of Annapolis. And we understand that. Um, we also understand the importance of this Richard Neutra edifice on the campus in Annapolis, in Maryland, and, and really on the East Coast. And 
we're approaching this project with a great respect for that um, in terms of how we wanna move forward. So with that, if we can move to the next slide. And it, it, please, if anyone wants to um, um, ask questions or interrupt, I'm not sure how you normally do these things, but please feel free to um, interrupt me. Yeah, it, it's a free flowing conversation. And we, what we, we typically do, is, it, unless we, we let you, you tell us what you wanna hear and then we'll have a conversation back and forth, unless we're unclear okay. about something, but it, it okay, is informal. Great. But yeah, we great. usually get to the, let you talk and complete your app. Uh, Okay, uh, so we do have an agenda today. It's broken into five pieces. So we're going to follow that pretty rigorously and it's, it's obviously based on the submission you already saw. So um, I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about Mellon Hall's location and its history over time, just to give you um, a little bit more background in case you're not as familiar with the building as, as you might otherwise be. Um, yes, yes, I will interrupt you. you. You should know that I was with St. John's for six years and I know every square inch of this building. Okay. <laughs> you should, uh, excuse me, Tim. Uh, they should also know that I'm a member of the board of the Friends of the Mitchell Gallery, so I'm also quite familiar with the building Same. and grounds. Right. Okay. Uh, do, but we're, we don't need in any way to recuse ourselves, but um, we, we won't go into it. But uh, I, we all love, so we have a lot of affection for this building, I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Uh, we will then talk a little bit about the reasons for the project and how um, and the, those reasons start to affect some things on the exterior of the building. And then we'll get into actually the three areas of particular study or, or areas of the building that are affected, uh, two of which are on the, um, um, on the facades of the building and one which is on the roof. Next slide, please. So obviously, for those of you who know, St. Uh, St. John's uh, Mellon Hall is located on St. John's Street. Um, for purposes of this presentation, we're gonna call the St. John Street elevation, the South Elevation, and the Campus Elevation, the North Elevation, just to make it simple. Um, obviously, this building is, is very important to the, the college in, in that it's one of the main, um, both, both the main uh, uh, classroom buildings on campus and laboratory buildings but also houses a couple of the large venues for gathering on the campus. So has a lot of uses on campus that are very important to the college. Next slide. Then I'd like to just talk a little bit about how this building today exists versus what it originally looked like and how those pieces have come together. So next slide, please. So in the center little image at the top is the full floor plan or floor diagram of the building. And the image on the left is a blow up of that um, most Eastern piece of the building, um, which is where the project, the, the project is located. Um, the orange part of the building here is, is the original Neutra building completed in 1956. There were two subsequent uh, major additions that happened. The first being in 1988, which is in the green which included um, the art gallery and an administrative wing, as well as a new entry into the, the building, which has become over, over the time since this was built, the main entrance to the building. Uh, in 2001, there were two other additions, one at the very um, Western end of the building where there's a conference room and then sort of the enclosure of the existing pergola um, off the courtyard um, that's now sort of called the cafe edition. Next slide. So what I'd like to do fairly briefly is just walk around the building. Um, we, we put together a series of drawings that show the, ex, the original building and how it exists today. Um, as far as we can tell from the, the um, um, of what happen, has happened over time, there's a couple of pieces of information that are, are sort of missing, but the most important pieces are here. Uh, first of all, on the south side facing St. John Street, you can see at the top the original elevation of the building. On the middle drawing, you see the addition of the conference room on the left in the light blue. And you can see that uh, image in, in the photograph, how that, that works on that piece of the building. And then I think of particular importance to this presentation is the area in pink. That's the area over the loading dock. Um, originally, the, that area, that piece of the building was, was two large sort of barn door like um, doors that actually slid open to allow things to get off of the loading dock into the back of the theater. Somewhere in time, we believe it was in the late seventies, those uh, doors were removed and what exists today was infilled. So that entire pink area you see there 
is not original to the Neutra building. Uh, it's now um, made up of a corrugated vertical metal siding and then inserted into that siding are two um, man doors and an overhead garage door that again allows things to be brought into the building from the loading dock. So I'm pointing that out because as we go through this, this is an area of the building we're gonna um, have further conversation about. Next slide, please. Uh, and then these are some uh, blowups of the building, uh, both of the addition to the, of the conference room um, on the left you see there and then on the right, uh, two images of that loading dock area, which from 1982 to now really has not changed significantly. Next slide. Turning the corner, we're now facing the east side of the building. Um, again, the two places where things have changed over the course of time um, were a minor addition of a, um, a louver in the, I shouldn't say minor, an addition of a louver in the um, the roof form of the theater, which you see there in sort of a purple. And then again, the addition of the gallery and that new entrance piece, which you see on the right-hand side. The next slide actually shows this better from the north elevation. So on the top here, going from the left to the right, you see the original Neutra entrance at the upper part of the lobby under the canopy, the expansive glass of the lobby, and then a brick wall the gallery was placed in front of that brick wall with the new entrance to the building located sort of cheek by jowl um, with the gallery and sort of coming forward from the um, original lobby wall. Next slide. And here you see two elevations of the original versus what exists today um, with those two additions on the right hand side of the image. Next slide. And then for thoroughness, we show, we're showing you the west elevation, uh, which had the addition of the conference room at the very end on the right-hand side. Again, we're not really um, touching any of this or contemplating touching any of this part of the building, but wanted to just show you the, the four sides of the building. Next slide. So the next thing I uh, wanted to touch on is what we're planning to um, do inside the building based on the college's wishes. Next slide. And without going into great amounts of detail, and I'm gonna focus on the right-hand um, uh, floor plan here. Um, the major pieces, and maybe go to the next slide, um, if you would. Um, we're going to talk about the lobby uh, that goes into the theater. And I think the importance of this piece is that the college feels very strongly that this is a very important gathering space, not only for the theater, but also for the campus as a whole and uses it as such and wants it to become um, an even more usable and accessible and, um, and welcoming place on the campus. So that's been a focus of our efforts in terms of the, uh, the interior, upgrading some of the finishes. Um, we're spending a lot of time upgrading bathrooms in terms of making them accessible and code compliant, um, as well as adding um, a couple lifts in the building that allow us to get from the lower part of the lobby to the upper part of the lobby on the back side of the building, on the south side, um, we're inserting some new program behind the stage house inside the existing walls of the building. So there's nothing really extending beyond the existing walls here, but we're adding some arts program behind the stage and what is very underutilized space right now. And so we're going to be affecting that area of the loading dock there that we saw in pink before in terms of how that uh, facade is treated right there. Next I'll slide. interrupt real quick. Um, <laughs> this won't, it won't affect here, but I just out of curiosity, are you also upgrading the lights and the sound in the theater? <laughs> <laughs> Allie will appreciate. Um, so I know this is a part of your uh, budget or your uh, state funding, and hopefully you've been able to put that program in because it was it's extremely necessary. So well, I'll put that plug in. I will just say that the um, you did such great work on that already, uh, getting some of that uh, specked out for us. But the the FSK auditorium itself is not part of this renovation. But we did okay. but we did get AV equipment and um, some upgrades through our Mellon grant. So right. uh, it, we're coordinating that with kind of how we're going to fix this uh, the stage house, the back of the stage. Good, and also yeah. the basement underneath it. Right, the, the basement is, doesn't look like it's in scope either. Well, I'll let them talk about this a little bit, but we're not really changing any of the 
rooms or the rock room at this point, but there's going to be work done underneath there just to support the program up, up above, but we're not really changing any program aspects below. Yeah, thank you for humoring me. None of that is in within the purview of the HPC. We only are looking at exterior. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So um, again, I understand that this is a pre-application um, pre meeting. We don't wanna presuppose that we know everything that you're gonna say or that you know, obviously we don't, but we have done some amount of research. Um, next slide, please. In terms of the guidelines and the standards that we understand are going to be important to you all, both in terms of the Annapolis Historic Design uh, District Design Manual um, as well as, next slide, the, um, uh, the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Historic Properties and Sustainability. And I think in particular, we have found a lot of great information in the, uh, the Maryland Inventory of Historic Properties for this building mm -hmm. um, in terms of some interpretation of what is really, was really important um, in the original design. So we, we've been very happy with a lot of that information that we've gleaned from that document. And we have referenced a lot of these sources throughout um, the part of the um, presentation that's coming up. We probably won't list every, every single one of them just for time, but they're all, um, they're all listed and written down on, our, um, on the documents that you've received. But again, this is where we're obviously seeking um, help from you and, and guidance from you on, on some of these guidelines. Next. So I'm gonna turn this over now to Dean Reineking from my office, who's going to go through the first two areas of study um, on the facades. Dean. Thank you, Gregory. And um, thank you to everyone on the commission. Um, I had the privilege to live in Annapolis uh, for a little bit of time and you guys have done some wonderful work with your preservation efforts there. So look forward to collaborating with you on this project uh, and how we continue to keep Annapolis as beautiful as it is. So. Uh, the three areas of the study that affect the exterior uh, we're going to go through tonight are at the southeast corner at the loading dock, as Gregory mentioned, at the lobby outside the FSK auditorium, and then also some, the inclusion of some solar panels at certain locations on the roof. So you can see those locations here. So we'll start with the southeast corner. Uh, as Gregory highlighted on the upper elevation, uh, the original loading dock doors at some point were altered and um, the sliding barn doors were replaced with a corrugated metal wall uh, with a smaller loading entry and two personnel doors. Uh, the inclusion of the 2001 addition on the left-hand side and the alteration of this uh, particular piece of the facade would seem to indicate that there's some flexibility here in terms of poten potential for some adjustment uh, to what exists within that masonry opening where the metal wall is today. So our proposed changes would be to create a new storefront system within that masonry opening. Uh, this would provide light as well as a uh, continued loading function for some of the new program behind the stage house. Um, and the design of that, um, after reading over the guidelines from the Secretary of Interior, uh, would be something that would be characteristic of the building, but not replicating any particular piece of the building. It would be a unique piece of design. It's also important to point out that that would exist within the current masonry opening. We're not proposing changing the scope of that opening um, as part of this process. And so this would potentially be a removable piece of the design if down the road, this building were to be restored to its original intent. Um, the second thing we would like to make an adjustment to on this side of the building is the trash enclosure um, inclusion on the loading dock. As you can see in the image on the lower right-hand side, uh, there are several trash cans that are stored out here today, and we would like to create a small metal enclosure on the loading dock. As you can see in the images on the right, there are a few existing utility boxes back here, uh, most of which are screened by bushes and trees, but you can see in the image on the right, uh, in the upper right-hand image, you can see those gray boxes, which represent the existing utility equipment. Uh, this metal trash enclosure, we think, would be in keeping with those either painted to match or some other neutral color that would help it to blend in on the loading dock. In the images on the left, you can see the, on the upper hand image, the um, existing conditions viewed from St. John's Street. 
and on the lower image, the inclusion of that storefront system and the new access doors. The second area we'd like to talk about this evening is the window wall along the lobby at the Francis Scott Key Auditorium. Um, this window wall, I'll take a moment and just sort of orient everyone to the existing condition. This faces campus. Uh, it really serves as the heart of the campus, social um, and academic life as students come to the auditorium for lectures or to the conversation room for seminars. So it has primary importance as the main entry facade. And you can see in the plan in the lower left-hand side, the original entry doors, which are under the steel canopy designed by Richard Neutra. Uh, those are, the, that's the original entrance. And then on the lower right-hand side, you can see the entrance to the 1988 gallery edition, which today functions as the main entrance of the building. Around the corner from the original entrance, there is a pair of double doors, which the Maryland Inventory of Historic Properties uh, Architectural Survey notes as an alternate entrance to the lobby. In the center elevation, uh, which is the north elevation, you can see the large span of plate glass uh, for that window wall that Neutra designed. Uh, based on the original drawings uh, that we found, that's quarter inch plate glass. Um, which in 1958 meant that it was untempered and um, is prone to shattering into large pieces. And uh, one of those panes, as you can see indicated, is broken and in need of repair currently. Um, the original entry doors and the alternate entry doors are no longer working um, and remain permanently locked. Um, so uh, there, that's another issue we would like to address in the course of this renovation. Um, we'll start by discussing a couple of the safety issues around the large plate glass and then um, show some of the existing documentation around that. And then we'll move into a couple of functional items uh, that the college would like to propose as part of the rehabilitation of the build. Sorry, was there a question? Okay. Um, uh, I'll just comment <laughs> that I know those doors pretty well and JR wonderful. fixed them constantly. <laughs> It did um, operate two years ago, so it's not in the many years, but they, okay. those doors are a constant source of... Uh, yes, um, and, and I believe the existing, the, they have been replaced once at least, and the existing hardware uh, was reused, um, but it's getting to the point where it's beyond its useful lifespan. So we'll, uh, we'll get into that in a moment. Um, so I'd like to take a moment and talk about the large format plate glass, um, because this is a, this would never have been designed under current building guidelines. Um, and there is a need to replace at least one of those panes. And as part of this project, uh, the college would like to address the safety issue that's posed by the design of this glass. Um, the international existing building code would require that all of this glass be replaced with tempered glass, uh, safety glass, because it comes down to the ground um, and is accessible uh, by pedestrians. So we've had this looked at uh, by a glass specialist and he's examined the existing structure and it's been determined that the newer tempered glass uh, would be too heavy for the existing structure. So that's gonna require us to redesign the mullion system to support that glass uh, if we're going to replace it to address the safety concern. Um, there's also no guarantee that in taking this apart um, that the mullion, existing mullions would even be able to be reused uh, because it was designed as a custom piece, really pioneering uh, the advent of this large format glass. It wasn't really designed with maintenance and um, replacement of pieces in mind. So uh, that's a, a consideration we'd like to present as well. Um, if we're going to replace the system, we also would be able to address uh, water infiltration issues and door and in air infiltration issues uh, at the existing doors in the process. So we'll walk through some of our existing our documentation of the existing conditions. Um, you can see in the image on the upper left, uh, there's a bike rack that is right outside the east elevation. Uh, you can see the glass corner of the glass wall there in the background. Um, there's a lot of pedestrian traffic, especially along this frontage. And so um, because of that constant back and forth, uh, there's concern about the side lights next to the door, uh, which are currently untempered glass. 
as I mentioned, the doors themselves have been replaced with tempered glass uh, specifically because of that safety concern. Hopefully those, those bikes will, racks will be gone sooner <laughs> rather than later. We I'm, I feel your pain on that. So. They're not particularly historic. I'll grant you that. No, um, and they're defunct. Um, <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I did not know that. Uh, the image in the middle, uh, the lower image in the middle shows the plywood patch that's over the broken plate of glass on the north elevation. Uh, you can see it there in the lower corner of the image. And uh, the image on the right is an example of fractured plate glass. Um, and we realized that St. John's has a very robust student body um, and we would hate for a croquet ball to go through one of these panes. <laughs> um, as we mentioned, there are signs of water infiltration along the bottom of this glass, um, which pose indoor air quality issues. Um, and so as we replace this system, uh, that would be something we would be able to address as well. This shows the image of the, the upper left-hand image shows the original doors and the alternate entry doors. And you can see the yellow signs there, which are pointing you around the corner to the 1988 edition uh, that say door closed. Um, the hardware is inoperable and um, the doors themselves uh, are permanently locked. And you can see with some of the close-ups, uh, the air infiltration issue on the lower right with the large gaps between the doors. Um, in the center image, you can see some maintenance attempts to address that issue. Um, and in the left-hand images, you can see, uh, again, more tape over some of those doors and um, some Band-Aids put on the uh, inoperable portions to try to address those concerns. Energy efficiency would be something that the college is interested in trying to improve for this space. Um, in some of our research, we looked at one of Richard Neutra's other uh, signature projects, Windshield House, which, is, which was in New York. Um, and shortly after this window wall was installed, um, high winds damaged the wall and caused it to implode um, with a tangled mess of aluminum and steel, or aluminum and broken glass uh, all over the floor. So um, this is a real concern. And uh, we recognize that Annapolis has significant weather events from time to time. and so we would like to address these concerns uh, before we're forced to address them. Uh, we also have looked at some other pioneers of modern architecture, uh, recognizing that Mellon Hall and the lobby are unique in some respects uh, to Annapolis preservation. Uh, we looked elsewhere to see other examples of how these issues have been addressed. And so Philip Johnson's glass house, uh, which is a hallmark of modern architecture has had its glass replaced with tempered glass. Um, falling water, likewise, has had its uh, wall, glass wall systems replaced and uh, the structure updated to support it. Um, and it's important to note here that uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, Philip Johnson, Richard Neutra, they were really pioneers of architecture. Um, they were pushing the limits of these materials and they often ran up against the limits um, because the technology simply wasn't available Dean, at the time they were question. designing. I could. So Please. Yes, go ahead. Um, uh, you keep saying a um, laminate or a tempered glass. I assume it's going to be yes. a tempered laminated glass for that size of pane? Uh, yes, that's likely the case. Are we also looking at an insulated glass or a I think space? Th so there are two distinct issues here. There's the safety factor, which is uh, would be addressed by the tempered, uh, perhaps laminated glass. Um, and we need to do more research to determine the exact product. Um, but the college is very much interested in addressing um, the energy efficiency issue as well, if possible. And so that's where we'd like to have some discussion um, okay. with the commission that, about what's, I, what's I available. I also end up with probably an inch or more thick piece right. as opposed to the quarter inch or whatever's there. Three right, exactly. Correct. And even I the tempered glass. Oh, go ahead, Gregory. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I, I think it, one of the things when, when uh, Dean says replace, you know, our goal here is to replicate um, in, in terms of the sight lines of the the um, mullion. And I think it's much easier to do that when it's just a single piece of glass, whether it's laminated, tempered, or both, versus it being insulated. We know that once we use an insulated piece of glass, normally um, the, the mullion needs to get larger because, or at least deeper, because of that, that insulated glass panel. So um, our, 
our intention here would be to replicate to the extent possible the sight lines of the mullions. And I, I understand the replication intent and support it wherever I can. I'm also wondering how this is going to be affected since you're basically doing a full replacement by the energy code, which you're just dealing with three, two walls or at least two major walls mm -hmm. and meeting the energy code is going to be difficult. If I remember. Well, we're, we're, we're here to really discuss the <laughs> Well, it, it affects the ultimately it affects replication the code. So ultimately it affects the appearance. That's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, right. definitely. It comes that's down to appearance. Talking about. Okay. Yeah, and that's why we wanted to bring this issue um, to you guys to hopefully get some guidance on how we go about reconciling these two diff obviously the historic aspect with uh, the practical aspects of the design. So okay. Okay. Um, if you guys have precedent for this type of thing, we would love to get some insight as to how that might be addressed. You're it. Congratulations. <laughs> not not at this scale. <laughs> Certainly not at this scale. Uh, Jim, did you have a, a comment? Uh, no, I think Dean's covered it very well. So I think we're we're fine there. Um, so I think we've touched on the safety um, issues largely, as well as um, the desire to address some of these other minor, more uh, more tangential issues um, to the safety. But there's two programmatic issues that we would like to address, um, given that we really need to replace this system and replicate it as closely as possible. Um, and those programmatic changes involve the inclusion of a new terrace to the south of the lobby. Um, and so. Uh, this space is really the campus living room in many respects. It's a gathering space uh, for students kind of at all hours. And um, St. John's is interested in trying to augment the usability of that space by the creation of an outdoor space that would be uh, sort of a partner to that lobby space, a space where people can spill out after an event uh, from the lobby to a terrace reception uh, type of space. So um, that's part of our cha proposed change to the landscape piece, recognizing this is mostly focused on the building, uh, but this is relevant because we would like to include some type of physical connection between the lobby space and that terrace uh, that doesn't utilize the existing entry sequence. So the first option for that would be the inclusion of new doors at the right-hand side of the terrace um, in the side of the 1988 edition. And so that connection is a bit more circuitous to the lobby and would require people to come sort of out the exit vestibule and onto the terrace. Um, so that's probably the less preferred option um, for the college at this standpoint. The second question would be the possibility of creating a direct connection from the lobby to that terrace space, um, utilizing doors within the new system that are visually very discreet and um, you know, wouldn't fundamentally change the overall character of the architecture. So those are two options uh, to address one programmatic issue. Um, the other item we'd like to raise is on the east elevation. Those alternate entry doors um, have not functioned for some amount of time. And uh, given that they are given less um, architectural significance in the survey. Uh, we'd like to propose omitting those doors in that system. Um, if at some time in the future, again, uh, this new modular system that we would be replacing this with uh, would presumably allow for these to be reinserted at some point down the road if that was desirable. Um, so those are the programmatic changes to the door and pieces of this. Um, the goal is not to fundamentally alter uh, the existing or the original entry sequences. Um, obviously we would be replacing the original entry doors, which would make them more usable. Um, but because this terrace is disconnected from the primary campus circulation, we don't think that these would take the place of the existing entry sequence. Um, these would simply be auxiliary doors to create that connection between the lobby and the terrace. We can discuss that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thought you might say that. Um, we've done a couple of comparative studies uh, just to show what the differences are. So in the top image, you can see the original, this existing condition 
1988 gallery on the right hand side and the original Neutsche entrance uh, under the steel canopy on the left. In the middle option, you can see the omission of the alternate entry doors next to the steel canopy. Uh, and in the right hand side, you can see the inclusion of new doors in the side of the 1988 edition. And on the lower image, you can see uh, the preferred option, which is to include that access directly to the lobby. Uh, we've also taken the opportunity to look at these under more realistic lighting conditions to see what the visual impact of the, those doors would be. So again, on the top, you have the existing condition. In the middle, you have the new doors in the side of the 1988 entry. And then on the lower image, you see the inclusion of the doors directly to the lobby. So if there's no questions on this piece, um, we'll go ahead and move on to some of the roof discussion. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Hall from Kessler Group. Thank you, Dean. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Hall. I'm an architect with Kessler Group. Uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, some concepts for a solar array proposed for the roof of Mellon Hall. Uh, Dean, if you could go to the next slide. Um, the, the following concepts are in response to the owner's goals to gradually introduce improvements to energy performance and implement sustainable practices. Having the largest area of flat roof on campus, Mellon Hall represents one of the best opportunities for such an installation while minimally affecting, if at all, the historic view sheds and roofscapes. The proposed design envisions an array that is uh, primarily over the uh, flat roof areas on the Southwest and Northwest classroom wings, as well as over the 1988 administration office edition, which are all highlighted in blue. In order to address the historic district guidelines to avoid diminishing the character defining features of the buildings and surrounding roofscapes, two orientations of solar panels are proposed for consideration, an angled panel system and a flat to the roof system. And we're seeking guidance on whether either of these approaches will be possible and meet the requirements of the guidelines and standards as they apply to the unique character of Mellon Hall. As you can see in the bird's eye perspective on the left-hand side of the screen, Mellon Hall contains a, uh, varying parapet wall heights, providing differing opportunities to mask new panels at different roof areas. In some conditions under the angled panel system where the existing parapet wall height is low, we are proposing the use of a low screen wall. In other areas, the existing parapet wall is high enough to mask any of the proposed panels. Um, go to the next slide. Sorry, can I just clarify that? So under the one proposal, the angled would require a, a masking or a, a, a parapet wall, but the flat one does not require that. From That's our, correct. And, and we do, uh, we're going to demonstrate that as well in some of our uh, follow-up slides. The, uh, so, so on this slide, we are we're demonstrating the layout okay. of the, uh, the proposed array and, and comparing the extents of the angled panel system, which is on the left, and uh, on uh, to the uh, flat to the roof panel system, which is on the right. The following slides will continue this comparison with the angled panel system shown on the left and the, and the flat panel system shown on the right. The option on the left considers the proposed panels uh, positioned at a 15 degree angle. Now this orientation allows for an optimal alignment for efficiency of energy generation, but as a result, the highest point of the panel is approximately 28 inches above the roof. As stated before, in locations where the parapet wall is low, we are considering a new screen wall that masks the uh, sawtooth profile of the array that, might, that may be visible from grade without screening. Um, the extents of the screen wall are highlighted here in red. The option on the right considers a flat panel approach. And while not as efficient, these panels can be placed behind the existing parapet walls to prevent visibility from grade without the need for a screen wall. And to counteract, to counteract the less efficient orientation, we proposed a larger array area. Uh, additional considerations for the proposed panel arrangement and layout stems from the need to avoid existing rooftop equipment, provide access for maintenance, and avoid adding screen walls to roof areas uh, that do not have existing parapets or where the rooftop is more visible from historic view sheds. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, these uh, next slides demonstrate the relationship of the existing parapet wall profiles to the proposed solar panels and screen wall systems. Once, ag once again, the angled panels were shown on the left and the flat panels are shown on the right. 
the perspectives at the uh, top of the screen provide a key for the location of where these sections were taken. A quick and question. Can, oh, sure. I'm sorry, I'm going to be a pain on this. No problem. Um, project. Um, is replacement of the roof a consideration during this work? Or are we going to be replacing that, do you think? We are currently studying whether or not the, uh, the existing roof requires uh, replacement as a, as a result of this installation. There are some areas of the roof that um, are, are nearing the end of its useful lifespan. Uh, and so we would definitely want to, uh, to, to consider that in this, this project as well. Well, if I may suggest while you're considering it, consider that if the roof is replaced, and I know Tim's going to smack me down again, uh, additional insulation will probably be needed, which is going to uh -huh. raise the roof and the height of everything up there. I, I definitely appreciate that. And we would uh, make sure to uh, bring that into consideration with this as well. That's a very good point. Thank you. So that was valid, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to word it differently so it doesn't sound no, like you're I'm doing it. That, that's right. No, it certainly um, would affect the profile uh, and, and these <laughs> sections. That's true. Uh, well, barring that, and, and as, you, as you indicated, we would need to uh, provide that uh, as part of the, the study moving forward. Um, but the, as you can see here, the parapet uh, wall height changes quite significantly throughout the building. And Dean, if you can go to the next slide, um, offering uh, some opportunity to mask uh, the parapets with existing elements, uh, but uh, that is not always possible with the angled panel approach in uh, the next slide. Uh, again, solar panels are highlighted in blue, and the, uh, the screen walls, again, only proposed for the angled system are shown in red. Thank you. Uh, next, we've studied uh, some of the uh, visual impacts of the proposed array to key areas around the building. Uh, this first view is taken from the northeast or campus side of the building. In the angled panel system on the left, the screen wall is just visible above the existing parapet at the lower and higher roof areas of the classroom wings. Uh, if this approach is acceptable, our goal is to uh, utilize materials and construction that help mask visible portions, or sorry, help make the visible portions of the screen wall fade into the background. Uh, on the right is the flat panel approach. And here, uh, there, there are no uh, panels that are, are visible from this orientation. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, this next view is taken at the top of the campus stairs near Randall Hall and McDowell Hall. As you can see, the uh, flat roof area over the lobby and the gallery are visible. So we have elected to avoid placement of any solar panels in these areas. Uh, once again, some of the screen wall on the angled panel option is visible over the two-story classroom ring, uh, wing in the background on the left-hand image. And uh, it is just visible over the administration office edition, although it is difficult to see. If you go to the next slide. Uh, lastly, we wanted to confirm that there would be no visibility of the proposed array along St. John Street. And due to the existing parapet heights, the height of the building on this side and the setback of the proposed panels, no panel should be visible um, from the street in either option. You can go to the next slide. Uh, lastly, we are considering the uh, construction of the proposed screen wall for the angled panel system. To provide a uniform and unassuming appearance, mask the equipment and minimize uh, lateral wind loading, we're proposing the use of a louvered uh, panel. Uh, the, we can, uh, painted metal or galvanized steel are possible to provide a, a matte sheen appearance and help the system fade into the background to avoid diminishing the character's aesthetics and roofscape. Um, with that, I thank you for your time. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll return the uh, presentation back to, to Gregory. And with that, I'll return the presentation back to Tim. So um, please take, take, take this and, and let us know what questions and comments you sure. have. Sure, sure. What, what we, we'll have a conversation and you've done a great job. I appreciate your um, showing some options and separating it into three pieces, which I think we need to talk about one at a time. Um, so if you don't mind, we'll keep your drawings up if we just, uh, scale back. What we're what we'll do is talk among the uh, talk among the commissioners first, um, and then we'll get input from um, John and Roberta uh, uh, about their thoughts. 
Um, there is, remind me, there is one public comment that did come in that I'll read, uh, read out to you. Uh, it came in pretty late, so you probably haven't seen it, um, but I'll read it. It has to do mainly with the, the third component. So when we get to the third component again, I'll, I'll go ahead and read that into the record. Um, so if, we, if you don't mind, I'm not sure who's driving the presentation, just go ahead and scale back to the, we'll look at the, um, the door, uh, the entry door um, first uh, to the backstage. Tim, while he's scaling back, I'd like to ask just a general question. And that is okay. um, in the original uh, proposals uh, submitted at our meetings, uh, there were uh, some landscape changes uh, including uh, a promenade leading out to um, uh, a new um, uh, sidewalk uh, on the um, open area of the campus. Are those still being discussed or is that is that a future presentation? That, those are being discussed, uh, Roberta, and I think we felt we wanted to get, um, because of the, the nature of our schedule, um, we wanted to get these first three things in front of you. Okay. okay. Yep. So the, the net of that is that'll be a separate, possibly pre-app, but there are a bunch of guidelines regarding landscape uh, materials and, uh, and design that, that we won't talk about tonight, but be aware that those exist. So you should be aware that those exist. Okay. So... Um, I'll just, I'll just make an, a general comment for you in terms of your approach, which you've done a great job of presenting um, alternatives, which is great. But what we're going to need to have you what in your final testimony, it's very interesting you have this Secretary of Interior standards, or not standards, but those, those, those guidelines there on the uh, SISTHP. Um, we'll try to help you tonight, but we need, all applicants need to be referring in order for all applicants to be treated equally. We, need, we are going to be citing back to you um, our, our design guidelines from our manual. So if you can cross-reference, that's going to take precedence effectively over these. Uh, mm -hmm. SIST page 78. There, it's, mm -hmm. it's great to see them, uh, but we're, we're going to, you've got D7, uh, you, you eventually, um, you, you, you eventually kind of get in, to closure, but that they're not as relevant as our, our, our guidelines are. I, I think okay. I speak for the commissioners when I say that. And okay. um, I'll just point out, we've also included some of the ones we think are relevant here, if it's helpful for you to. Yeah, if there's you some can more see, thing, we my list is a lot longer. Great, <laughs> so, we would appreciate that list. <laughs> yeah, and so when we're talking about each of these features, we'll, we'll try and yeah, yeah. Wonderful, thank so, you. It just, it, it's helpful to have it on this page. That's all. Yep, we understand. Okay, super. All right. Yes. So, yeah, Will. Are we going to ask Roberta to comment first? Don't we usually ask her um, to comment before? We do, but uh, she just asked me if, if we would talk about it first tonight. Okay. Just because sure. she did. Yeah, she, she preferred, preferred I, that. Tonight. I value what she has to say so much that I wanted to hear her first. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, you will. You will hear me. Good. <laughs> But she just thought yeah, that she, I get it. No, that's okay. <laughs> so um, what, do you have thoughts, Will, on, on this particular component, the, the back wall? Uh, the back wall is the one that I think is um, the one I feel the most positive about because, first of all, what's there is not original and it's not very attractive. And I think they made a very um, uh, constructive uh, proposal there. So um, right now, I wait to hear what the rest of you had to say about that. Yeah. Bill? Um, I like what they're proposing, and I'm concerned about it at the same time. We now have a glass wall that looks into what? Now, that's it not a like main street. A black box. It looks like it's a new black box theater, if I read it correctly. Yeah, but with that big opening, you're presenting the interior of the building. So the interior becomes part of the design. It ends up just an area where they're storing boxes and leftovers and parts and pieces. So, yeah, it, it's really meant to be a flexible, um, and I, I'm going to say this, but a, a classroom, a performance space, um, you know, a meeting room, a, a dance, you know, something for a ballet class, very flexible in terms of its its use. Okay, because it's initially not storage. Really a delivery zone, so. 
I understand. It, it does ahead. still, it still does allow, you know, to have deliveries through the space, but it's yeah. not a, it's not an, a loading dock. It's not a receiving area on the inside. And from the various times I've been back there, whatever you did to it would be an improvement. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we, it looks like we're trying to replicate some of the glass spacing to the, at the left end, a little addition at the end is, Am I seeing that? That was that was definitely that? a precedent. Yes. Okay, so we're 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 following the basic design elements within the building. Um, I was, I was depending on what the millions end up look like, I think it could be very nice, a good addition, nice addition. Bobby, um, I'm kind of along the same lines that you were saying, Tim, that, you know, obviously it'll be an improvement over what's there. Oh, yeah. um, I'm, other than that, I mean, this is newer stuff than we normally look at. And so for me, it's, it's kind of a, a new area. Um, but I, I, I like the approach that they're taking. And I think that um, provided it's not a, a loading dock type of scenario, and they've just said it isn't, um, I think it's an intriguing idea um, uh -huh. kind of opening up this area of the building to the outside world, essentially. Yeah. Hey, Bobby, uh, you need to get out of the 17th century. And <laughs> this, this is historic 20th yes. century. Yes. 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 Highly historic. Yes. So I, I we, actually... we want to defend this building as much as possible while keeping it relevant to the time. Yes. yes. In, no, in I, fact, I this... Agree. I mean, just... Each building in its own time to its own time, but yes, correct. I, just don't, I just don't have as much experience with you know something that that's a lot closer to our own lifetimes. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, this one was built when I was alive, um, but um, <laughs> I should have said at the top we're all aware that this building has special designation within the city of Annapolis, and was that was done uh, intentionally in um, I want to say two thousand four. Mm -hmm. um, and so even though 2003 uh, 2003 so it has a special designation therefore it will, would be kept at that pretty much our strictest standard of, of um, review and it does and, represent um, pretty much everything we wouldn't accept in town now <laughs> <laughs> well no it, well I don't know it all depends on where it was built uh, good point, good point. Um, it depends on its neighbors um, so, um, uh, Kim, I, I'm not sure. Are you able to see on the Zoom, uh, on the YouTube? Are you able to provide comment? Yeah, I'm on three different devices right now. Okay. <laughs> Do you have a thoughts on this this building component? Um. Well, I think it must be a daunting task to be working on such a significant building. So, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of the architects uh, in discussing it and considering it. With regard to this facade, I, I think that it's um, having the, the uh, a curtain wall seem much friendlier to the surrounding environment than uh, the loading dock scene that's always seemed sort of jarring there. Um, so I, it, it seems like um, um, a, a, a extending a hand out into the community. Um, so I'm, I mean, it's all going to be in the details with regard to this, but mm -hmm. I, it seems like, uh, I think it seems like a, an approach that's, uh, that has a lot of promise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the, this, of the three things that we're going to discuss, this is the uh, least, um, has the least, uh, impact on the existing fabric, um, you could argue, I, I could argue that restoring it to its original state would be preferred and that would be consistent with the Secretary of the Interior. That you want to restore a feature. We don't have, you have not presented any photographic evidence of that and uh, that's, that's a pre prerequisite um, and, and um, I, I hesitate to say this is, sec is a secondary facade either because of the, uh, of the importance of this um, 
building again being very strict um it, it the the character of of this facade from its original design was characterized by these vertical louvers to the to the west there that's the important character defining feature of this facade on the original building we've got this new extension on on further to the west which kind of already invalidated the <laughs> the integrity of the original design. And, and this one is, this feature is less prominent than that one. So I think the, mm. the facade's already kind of compromised. And so I, I think that I could defend why we wouldn't be super try, trying to restore a Neutra feature, which we don't think is that significant. If you were gonna remove the louvers, that would be significant. <laughs> But um, can you, um, this is a, it's been an issue for us. If you could help us find a photograph of the original loading dock, we have searched and searched and we, we just yeah. could not find one. Um, I'll, I'll uh, wow, I can, we, we will look. That, I'm not sure that would help support your case. But <laughs> well, we I, I'm, I'm the, in, the thing that would interest me would be the notion of doing maybe some, some, um, you know, a large glass sliding doors um, yeah. that would replicate the barn doors, but in a different kind of material. Well, I, I think if we were going to go down that path, we'd want to be replicating it and not reinterpreting it. Uh, that's me. Uh, and I, I think that we have, um, and the program of this building, you know, is important. I, I, so I, I think the idea that you're trying to match the, 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 the addition for the Hudson room, the conference room down there, it kind of hangs together. Mm -hmm. If I may, um, when the building was built, I'm gonna to have to check my timelines exactly to figure out when the, this- 56. Well, not, 56. Not, not, not in that respect. Um, the railroad, the BNA railroad was still coming in town, I believe to that area. This would have backed the BNA railway yard. You know what it would have backed, yeah. to, be, to be accurate, it would have backed a housing project. This it was, was the actual housing public, project by that point? This was, the, this was yeah. Bloomsbury Square housing project. Yes. Okay, it was Bloomsbury at that point. Okay, yes, it was. But, but it was still backing the steam plant of the state. Yes, a little bit farther so, up. What, what I'm looking at is this, the road it is on really has been a service road, a back yeah, I agree. road, so it is a back door. The loading dock, is a loading dock, it's back of house. The building itself, in my interpretation, was designed to face the campus, face the quad, face out that way. And the fins, as great a defining feature as they are, they were a architectural flourish to an alleyway. <laughs> All right. I actually want to jump in here, if I may, Tim, uh, sure, for a similar reason. I think um, the gist of what Bill is saying and others have alluded to is what I would agree with, that the main facade facing the um, center of the campus is the one that I'm very hesitant to support any change to at all. So it's restoration and replication first and foremost. But yeah. this, as Bill just said, is a service road and has been for a very long time and often looks quite unattractive to the community in many ways. Yeah. Not saying I support exactly what the applicants have presented here, but that would be a dramatic improvement. Anything along those lines, I think I could be brought to a place where I would support it. Okay. This, this is Roberta. I can jump in here. Um, okay. I just wanted to say that. It, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes, I hear you. Okay. Um, uh, this design of this corner has actually evolved. It, it is uh, a little different that was, than what was originally presented to us. And um, I would say it's much improved because the uh, earlier um, Proposals involved multiple or at least uh, several openings punched into the blank walls. So you still have uh, Neutra's 
kind of austere box-like corner, but um, this is using uh, the um, existing opening. That is very so important. To, to me, it is uh, in, improved over um, some of the earlier proposals. It's also okay. not stopping a future restoration of the original. Right. That's a good point. Excellent point. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to raise the, the kind of the, the, the other potential devil's advocate, but I was, I was truly playing the devil's advocate. I concur with the other commissioners that this appears to be feasible, this feature. Okay. Um, why don't we move around the corner then? Tim, sorry to interrupt. Um, is there any feeling toward the metal trash enclosure on the loading dock as part of that? I'd want to see drawings. We make it pretty. Drawings. I, okay. And he thinks, yeah, make it pretty. No, nothing no. in principle, though. Okay. No, no. And the more you relate it to a modernist look, I mean, you relate it to the building, we're not going to be asking you to build a brick wall or anything. Well, like it, it kind of could be <laughs> what you have actually shown there, just a box on the corner. It, it really, yeah, the minimalist uh, approach is, is best in this regard. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what we'll we We'll try to make it go to. away. <laughs> yeah, be, be consistent with the, its immediate environment. Anything's better than a bunch of uh, yeah. recycling bins on, on a right. broken down loading dock. Right. Okay. It might be worthwhile putting a ramp to that loading, loading dock or... <laughs> Too much information, right? <laughs> um, okay, so um, I, again, on, on, on the guidelines, you do pick up historic replacement when you pick up on D16, but we'll probably be talking an awful lot about D3 here, uh, significant original features, um, which is gonna be important. Um, so who would like to go first in terms of concerns or, or tell us which guidelines you believe are, are gonna be a challenge here. I have a question. Yeah, I have a question also. Go ahead, Bob. Um, how do we balance safety, life safety and historic preservation? A valid question. Um, I guess we have, maybe we should, we should even um, segment the discussion further then into the treatment of the glass itself and then the change, we have two options and I really do appreciate the applicant presenting us with two options to compare and contrast. So um, to answer your, to my opinion about life safety is we do our, it obviously is more important than a historic building because if someone dies because a, a, a feature falls down on them and cuts them, <laughs> you know, yeah. so we are not, completely unconscious to that. On the other hand, I think the applicant has already said they're aware of what they need to do to get the mountains and the materials as close to original as possible. Yeah, I mean, if to, if to come into a safe circumstance, they have to potentially alter a historic, a historic front, Obviously, we would want them to do it in a way that is the most compliant, if there is such a thing, and is the most respectful of the building that currently exists. Exactly. I agree. Will, will you have a comment? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm very concerned about the uh, plantings that are on the interior, um, and I have never been able to find an answer to whether that was uh, Neutra's planting scheme. Um, but I am aware that he was interested in the dynamic uh, relationship between interior uh, and exterior spaces, as many of his contemporaries were. So if somebody, anybody can tell me definitively that he planned to have large uh, plants like the ficus trees ficus, yeah. and the other things that are growing today, eventually develop to that scale, I, I wanna know that before I really make up my mind uh, about what is being proposed, because it seems like the applicant is proposing to do away with all of that. I think um, to, to answer that question, in the research that I've done in, in the reading, and Roberta may, may disagree with this, I did not find anything specific about 
the the landscaping in that area in in any of the the readings that I had about Neutra or the building specifically about that. Okay. Okay. Um, well. I will go back to it, but I don't recall seeing anything in the survey uh, either. Uh, it's a good point that uh, Will makes, and I think it deserves some a little further research. Okay. Then I await. Um, yeah, illumination. Yeah, and again, the, the onus is on the applicant to do as much as you can to support your you know, evidence of, of that that feature. Um, so, so life safety is important, but I think uh, what I, what Gregory already said, I, I think, is what we are looking for is the balance between life safety and maintaining the uh, integrity of the design of this very important facade. Um, I, I will have to say just as a point, because this, this came up during our, our research with the, the fabricator of, 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 of glass systems. And when we were out on site, because at the beginning, we, we really thought, well, we can, um, we can restore this. Um, we can make it a mm. little more weather tight and waterproof. The issue came up when we wanted to replace this one piece of glass. And he said, you know, I can't put another piece of plate glass in there. Um, and you're not going to find anybody that should. <laughs> and if you want me to put a piece of tempered glass, you're going to have to replace the mullions. And so that was the moment when we said, okay, we really yeah. need to think about this a little more holistically. Yeah. Gregory, so did it's a you, conundrum. this is Roberta. Roberta, did you consider um, creating a tempered glass by uh, laminating to it? Laminate yes. to the existing and therefore create a tempered glass. I, I think so. I think that is what they were they were considering, Roberta. If I understand you, and the issue is that just that piece of glass is is so much heavier and the wind load greater that the mullion would not be able to support that, the existing mullion. These pieces of glass are, you know, uh, Dean, what, 13 they're, feet they're high 13 by eight feet, feet wide. Or, about eight yeah. feet wide, so. So they're very um, large. And the existing structure is, is well under what we would design to support that amount of glass today. Yeah. Okay, so you're, you're saying that uh, you cannot laminate a film to the existing glass without changing the mullion. Oh, a piece of film. Um, I, that is something I don't think we investigated. I understand what you're saying now, a piece of film. Um, to provide the temper. Yeah, we, we can, we can, um, we can investigate that. That's a good point. Okay. I don't know if that is, if that meets the the safety issue requirements, but we can certainly investigate that. Um, a, a point just to keep terms, tempered is a heat treated glass that breaks in small pieces. If it has yeah, right. a film, it's a laminated. Right. So, and you can laminate tempered glass, you can laminate regular glass. What the tempered laminate glass is similar to what you have in a car windshield. When it breaks, you see it just spider or shatter but it stays there. If the side window breaks, it goes into just a bunch of little pieces. The problem comes in when you laminate just by the fact that you're laminating on both sides or you're shooting a piece of plastic between two pieces of glass, it automatically becomes thicker. The larger the glass gets, height, width, and all, the thicker it has to get so it doesn't flex enough to break on its own. As you get thicker, the mullion channels have to get bigger. They also have to get larger just to hold that additional weight due to wind load. It's called starts, everything you add just starts multiplying the system. What was designed here was a very lightweight, very thin minimalist system that today will not meet code. That's kind of what I was trying to get to in the beginning. So how do we maintain the historic presentation as well as possible and meet the codes that are going to have to be met. Right. This, is, this is a question for us at HPC because the designers here don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. uh, 
it's John well, Tower here, uh, just jumping in. Uh, uh, it's standard practice within the historic district to laminate existing glass to retain original glass. So in this case, it's unusual because the pieces of glass are so large. Yeah, exactly. uh, but uh, it it passes, I think, and I don't know about about this size, uh, but uh, it allows historic windows to remain in bathrooms and other areas uh, where they would typically have to be removed and tempered glass mm -hmm. installed. So I'm just saying there, it's a common practice. Uh, within the historic district yeah. currently. Yes, uh, John's right. Almost every building permit where there's a new bathroom with an exterior window, we, re we request and uh, are able to uh, achieve approval for laminating the original windows, not replacing them. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would have to say, and, and I'm not saying that this is, this is definitive, but in our experience of large windows, um, and, and in particularly new construction, when you would use a, a laminated, laminated glass, it would be a laminate that's in between two pieces of glass that, that gives that extra. large piece of glass its strength and, 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 and character, um, rather than it just being a laminate uh, film on one side or the other, or, or even both sides. Or both. So, something we could do more research to find out if it's possible to just laminate something to a large piece of glass. I, I have not seen that in you know, new um, large plate glass construction in my experience, but it doesn't mean it, it's not possible. Yeah. The I think the little consideration on that is you're having this in a public area where there's significant traffic. Oh, and yeah. that lam the reason it goes between the glass is to protect that laminate because it, even though it has the strength to hold the glass, it itself is rather fragile. Mm -hmm. It can get right. scratched and that would destroy the whole yeah. property. Well, I think Gregory has shown and uh, agreed that if you can, with your research, um, continue the conversation as an al alternate, um, and then, then we can go from there. But it's worthwhile from a evidence or testimony point of view to say we looked into this and it is either a possibility and it may be a good one and maybe it's not feasible and doesn't really meet mm -hmm. the safety goals that you have. Okay. Certainly. I'd like to see it. Okay. I really would appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. And this is Roberta again, if we would also be interested in seeing if you feel that it does have to be replaced with tempered glass, how Closely, can the mullions match the original? Correct. Correct. So we'd like to see a comparison of those. Roberta, I would assume uh, the same question applies for insulated, and in that we would just want to show that side by side comparison between existing, you know, single pane safety glass and maybe what an insulated would do. Right. I'm guessing the insulated has to have a thicker mullion, but. That would be my uh, hunch, but yeah, we'd okay. be we'd be happy to see it. Okay, yeah, great. And so, as long as we have drawings to present, that yes. should allow for that to be discussed. Okay. Um, okay, so that kind of talks about the plate glass issue. Let's talk about the two options, um, wh which are presented with the doors. Which, uh, thank you. That's great. Um, who would like to go first on this discussion? I will, always. <laughs> um, it, it's, this really does get down to the, our, our guideline D3, significant original features of an important, most important facade in the building. And um, the option of putting doors in the middle of a, character defining feature of this magnitude, I, I do not believe is <laughs> compliant with our guideline D3. Um, I also believe that the closing off the door with windows under the canopy, again, that, that canopy is a significant character defining feature in this modern building. 
also just would just be to a clarify, um, Tim, sorry, we were we are replacing the doors in the canopy at the canopy. We were we were oh. keeping those. It was the ones facing the the what we were calling the east side that we were removing. I when you say I saw an, I thought I saw an option. I thought John, Dean presented an option to actually close those doors. Um, yes. Sorry, I, I may have not been totally clear on that point. Um, our proposal would be to make, replace the existing doors under the main canopy. Um, okay. There is an additional set of doors. I'll go to the plan here so we can see. Sure. The existing, yeah. um, the intent would be to replace the ones that are under the canopy because those were the original main entrance Correct. facade. Okay. The ones we're proposing to close off are the ones that are around the corner at the alternate. Okay. Entrance. They're I not the in one of in one of your drawings, I could have sworn I saw that you were also intended to replace those because those weren't. Now. I hope that wasn't the case. I'll, I'll <laughs> we'll make sure that that's correct for the next presentation. Um, if that's so, maybe maybe we should move around the building. Closing off the doors on the parking lot side um, it is not as uh, much of a compliance issue for me, um, and again, that allows the program to move forward for the for the applicant, but. So th then keeping the doors that are under the canopy, peer, pun punch punching through this the, the facade um, with two new doors. Um, you did a great job in your drawing here, but I, I believe the elevation shows it more to a certain extent. That, that would change that design feature substantially in my mind and, and would not be uh, compliant with, uh, with our guideline D3. So that's where I kind of am. So I, I'm saying option one, Putting, putting, putting doors in the new lobby area, um, the newer lobby area by the gallery is a, is a solution that is, is I think, comp uh, more comp is compliant. What do other commissioners think uh, about that? And then we'll ask Roberta to chime in. Tim, I agree with you. Bobby? The same, especially on the main facade. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna say someone going back away from it immediately. <laughs> Design wise, I like the idea of the doors being added there because of the way they open the inside to the outside. Yeah. But unfortunately this building was not designed to do that. Therefore, I think it would be a bad decision for the building. And I include with that, adding the two doors, if I saw correctly, that were to the, in this image, that right side entry projection. I wouldn't want those there as, as well because it just adds something that isn't there. Now getting rid of the side doors, I don't see that as an issue. Yeah. Did I confuse myself enough? No, no, I think, I think <laughs> we think out loud. So, so the applicants now, we, we tend to think out loud. No, in that's good. Meetings. And so you, basically we end up with just the two main entries and why I'm putting at the screen. Cause I think you can see what I'm looking at. I don't know. Yeah. So we have the two main, we have the two, basically two main entrances and that's all that's left now. Yeah. I, I guess my, my feeling about adding the doors in the foyer that that's not a contributing feature to the original design. So I, I was less concerned about it. Well, I, I look at the feature being as much that plaza as the building itself. Yeah. Because that is a, it's sort of an inside outside thing. The glass just separates the two, yeah. which it, if it was a, again, original design, I could see having two doors in that large opening to create a courtyard That's that you literally yeah. flow in and out of. But since that wasn't done, that separation, I just feel, needs to be maintained. Mm -hmm. well, if I may ask, um, and, and I'm, speaking, I'm speaking for the, the college here, not, as, not necessarily as the architect. Um, you know, the, the, the goal here was to have somewhat of a convenient access as, as the use of the building has been altered over time and, and the lobby has become more of a um, a central gathering place for the college. You know, the, I'm, we're asking for consideration to have some uh, door at that lower level because the doors in the existing 
um, under the existing original canopy are at a different level. So it makes it harder for folks to get down to the, the plaza. So the, uh, the issue here was trying to create a, a closer connection from the lobby to this outdoor plaza as a convenience and an accessible path. Yeah, I, I understand that, but I would argue that it is not a new thing that this portion of the building has changed in function. It has always been the lobby to the auditorium and uh, a gathering and a place. It, perhaps it's become more important as a public uh, for functions, <laughs> cocktail parties. Um, but I would argue that that doesn't override the original design. Um, the original design did not include an outdoor plaza. Uh, it doesn't. Well, it doesn't. I, I guess I'm sorry. I was I was speaking about the doors off of the 1988 edition, oh. um, okay. in terms of providing yeah. some some closer access um, to the of plaza. a few feet and an easier flow. I I can see that. And so Bill Bill is I guess saying one point that that is too much, and I, I I'm actually okay with those doors. Yeah, I should um, say I'm okay with that concept too, but I'd like to see it more fully developed. Yeah. Gregory, I'm used to them not agreeing with me. I just throw things out there and they throw them back. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, I'm, I'm always on that side too, Bill. So, you know, I, I, I feel the pain. Um, I, I, I always like to also <laughs> say why I, why I, and this is what my, you'll hear me say. I mean, th that is not a violation or a problem with D3 significant original features or a D5 replacement and repair, where is putting doors in the major panes do are not compliant with those two specific guidelines. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, who didn't, uh, Kim? Uh, would you like to chime in further? She might be on mute. Kim, you're still on mute on your phone. Sorry you have to juggle so many devices. <laughs> Kim, I'll give you another minute. Just out of curiosity, is there anything we can do about that hideous HVAC unit we can see in this? You're going to be covering up our uh, covering up your solar. Is there some way to cover that thing too? <laughs> well, solar is not going to be. On that I don't even think that's an original feature. So no, it's not. We can put solar panels in front of it. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> that could actually be an improvement if it's done right. <laughs> Okay, so on, on, on this particular discussion, have we provided the feedback? I think that certain this components- This is Roberta, I would like oh. to speak oh. as well. Go for it, sorry, sorry Roberta. So uh, in, uh, in my mind, adding doors on the north elevation to that current curtain wall, the original curtain wall does violate D3 preservation of original features. I have a question, uh, were the doors on the east corner there uh, part of the original design? Yeah, they were. They were. Okay. So I think that also uh, violates D3 if you um, remove those. Um, mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think what does meet the guidelines is uh, restoring the original doors, the original door uh, on the north, and then... Um, adding a door to the 1988 edition. Mm -hmm. That's a valid point. Um, it's sometimes we get into different um, interpretations on different facades as well, um, but I can see where you're coming from. In fact, that is the door that people go to from the parking lot first, the existing doors, and they're always locked because they don't work. But that's no reason to throw out the guidelines, so. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, I know I understand, and, and I, I understand Roberta's point as well. I think, um, you know, and I, I don't know how you all work exactly. I would say just for consideration, again, if, because those doors, you know, are not, uh, because of the way they're, they're designed, they'll never be very weather tight. Um, so that, you know, 
even when we replace them, they're going to have some, some leakage. Um, they'll probably be closed because the college, as I understand it, will not want to use them because they want people to go into the main entrance where there's a vestibule. Um, and all depends the on the cost event. of the, <laughs> and the cost of them is not inconsiderable versus, sure. you know, so, you know, if, if they're not going to be used and they at some point could be replaced, if you were to go back and make the building completely historically accurate, I would just ask you your consideration or your, your yeah. feedback as to, you know, whether that's those, those two pairs of doors are really crucial. I understand well, Roberta's point. Yeah, I, I do too. And um, okay. I'll speak for the commissioners and they can interrupt me if they'd like or change. What we try to do is we try to understand the programmatic needs of, of the applicant and, 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 and we'd be as um, responsive as we can within our purview, so. May I put two cents in? Of course. <laughs> Good, I'll make it five. Um, the doors on the side, I feel that the design of the building itself makes those doors irrelevant in that you have a rhythm of the main glass running throughout that building, which that those doors actually interrupt. They are underneath the high canopy. The, the main doors from the campus has its own yeah. canopy system, if I can remember right. Yeah. yeah. And it's almost as if those side doors were an afterthought. Someone said, oh, we have a parking lot over here. We better throw some doors in there. And I can see the architect going, oh, God, what did they just do to my building? But uh, so if the Mayan system of the main glazing is maintained, so you get that rhythm across that facade, I don't think it's in any way detrimental to the building. And as Gregory had said, if it becomes an issue later down the road, just like the back door, it can be replaced. It can be still put in because you still have that rhythm. Yeah. So now we need now we need door. Richard Neutra to speak to, uh, to no. defend his <laughs> that, That's where I was going to go. <laughs> I was a slippery slope. Up. We can dig him up, Tim. Yeah, if those are original doors, I could be persuaded to consider something that preserved their outline, uh, their the the formal rhythms that their presence creates, but I would have to. Um, disagree politely with my fellow commissioner. I don't think you can take that away. And if, even if it was a mistake and Neutra knew it, they got built with his name on them and they deserve to be preserved. Okay. Yeah, we do run a slippery slope if we start redesigning in a masterpiece. And I expected that. <laughs> Spoken like an architect, right? Um, <laughs> well, I think we have, we have a discussion then about whether, whether they should be replaced at all uh, um, with, with fixed panels or whether maybe fixed panels that represent. We have other de designs where we, we have a representation, but they're not operable. Uh, they are the, terribly um, drafty, as you know, Tim. So this is a question should we come back with an option to remove those? Obviously you all would, would um, vote on that. I mean, you know, if they were not approved um, to remove them, obviously we could put the glass back in. So are you, would it be, would it be, <laughs> is it worth our endeavor to continue down this road or do you, would you recommend as a group that we, let that go and i mean and obviously we'll know. speak with the college after this but yeah well um, um, I, I, it's difficult right now i'm bobby um you know, right, right now it seems like we have a divided opinion among commissioners as to whether this original feature and also from staff whether this original feature should be maintained or whether we would allow it to be modified so right now it's it's a difference of opinion among the commissioners. So I, I, I think it, it, it's um, worth your while to present um, an option which we don't see in front of us right now which, with those doors restored. 
Bobby, did you have something to say? No, I was just, I was going to say that if nothing else, the applicant has, has learned that we all have differing opinions. We all come at it from a slightly different perspective and that putting in front of us a well-constructed argument with good documentation, historical background, and, you know, a, a careful eye to what the intent of the original design was will go a long way towards, you know, furthering their argument. Got it. However, it does appear that there is unanimous uh, agreement on not breaking up the curtain wall on the north with side. New doors, correct? I believe that is unanimous. Yeah, yeah. I think we hear that one loud and clear. And some back and forth also on the uh, door on the foyer, whether it, it, it can be in installed or not. Yeah. So some back and forth on that too. So I think we have some difference of opinion there as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Should we um, move to solar panels next. Yes. Um, Did we address? Let's do that. Here? I think everything here has been addressed. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> well. Um, first of all, we did get some public comment um, regarding uh, the. Uh, this, let me see if I can find that real quick. Um, from Historic Annapolis, um, yes, um, the, because this building is highly significant, a high standard of view. And so this is from Karen Brown at uh, Historic Annapolis. And her comment is this building is highly significant and a high standard of review and preservation should be applied we do express concerns with one aspect of the project, the proposed photovoltaic cells, in particular, the angled panels. Guideline D12 addresses skylights, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the, guide, the commission's design guidelines do not address solar pan, panels, but we have referred to this design guideline for skylights, specifically the need to maintain a low profile. Uh, like skylights, solar panels should be flat glazed and mounted as close to the roof as possible. We have concerns that as proposed, the solar panels will impact the view shed from McDowell Hall and the surrounding buildings. So uh, that's in a typical pre-application, we would um, provide that to a, a public, the public can come to these pre-apps and, and make that type of comment for your information. So taking that on board, um, we have two options in front of us. Um, who would like to comment um, first? All right, oh, come I'll on. Go. go. <laughs> <laughs> um, while I'm normally a fan of solar panels, while they sure. provided they follow our uh, can't be seen from the street, you know, recommendations, and that they they fall pretty well in with, with skylights. Um, what little I know of this architect, I know that his style is unadorned, simple, nothing added to it, you know, and that's the beauty of it. And anything to me that adds that additional piece along the roof line, that, that to me goes against the design of the building. So while I'm not opposed to skylights in general on this building, the, oh. the, the tilted ones that. present a problem for me. Okay. And again, from a, from a design guideline point of view, we're really talking about um, messing with the character defining feature, which is this, okay. the, the, horizon, the intense horizontal horizontal nature of the building right. um, and I'm, I'm making a very broad assumption that what when they're saying these these panels cannot be seen from grade I'm assuming they mean grade basically anywhere yeah you know, John's is not a flat campus there's there's raised spots and lower spots so very much so and um, so would you would you, if the if the tilted angled ones are not 
even close to feasible, what would you say if, if they were flat and they did not need to add the parapets? You would still be able to see them from the upper campus. I, uh, and that's the thing, I, I don't know the, the campus well enough to know where that would be and how that would be. That would be, I would wanna see a lot of information about that in, yeah. the, in the application. Okay. And again, this is protection of uh, overall character of roofs, which is D9 right. and D3, again, significant original features, which again, is the whole roof is a horizontal component yeah. that has, uh, so we're challenged by that. Yeah, and I um, think Will's got his hand up, so. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, I more or less agree with Bobby and I would go further and say that I think from the uh, stairs there uh, facing the, the, the mall, uh, you can see portions of the roof. And while I want to support the uh, solar panels wherever I can, and I think there might be ways to do that with the flat panels, you're still going to see them, at least some of them. So I'm very hesitant in this case to <clears throat> agree to it, but I'd like to see more designs and um, renderings from those elevated areas of the campus. If, is the issue from the upper campus as a pedestrian on the upper campus, or does the issue go to being in a building and being on one of the you know upper floors of the of a For building on both. the upper campus? For me, it's both. Oh. Um, okay. I would say from the balcony or from the, but both, yeah. From both and from the front steps of the back side of McDowell Hall is yeah. a prominent view. Um. If you're gonna say it's both, that's gonna eliminate solar panels without even any other session. Because you go up into McDowell or some of the other buildings where you're a couple yeah. floors up, you see the whole roof. Do you? Um, okay, yeah, I haven't so been up When there. does that become unreasonable? Bill, what that, that's why I said both, because I'd like to see them produce renderings and photographs that would show um, much as they are here, what's the view from the, uh, backside of uh, McDowell Hall on the third floor, you know, uh, now and what they're proposing. So two drawings, two photographs, that would be enough to let me make up my mind. But they okay, don't have right. to do that. Okay, so you just have a concern. It's not, yes. you're not against it. Okay, yeah. I misunderstood. I was just thinking I was going to walk out there again. It's been, and now that I have a better understanding, <laughs> and it's just the blue roofs, is it not? That we're correct. Yes, that's yes, okay. correct. That's the current proposed yeah. uh, and extent of the array. And the the blue roof to the right, uh, I'm sorry, it's a one story structure. Mm -hmm. The back side there is a two story structure. Correct. So it's actually more of a problem on the addition um, connecting the buildings and the low flat roof. It's so mm -hmm. to break this into. Well, let me just check. Um, well, Kim, can you, have you rejoined us? Or can you unmute yourself? We'll get Kim to email us or comments, I think. Um, so you're hearing our, our struggle uh, with particularly the angled roof for, and, and this is my thought, the angled um, panels create a new design requirement, which further modifies the original building. And that's the um, baffled wall. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That makes it, you're adding a design element to an existing mm -hmm. uh, protected building. And I, I don't believe you're adding, I think you're adding insult to injury. First of all, you've got the panels which are angled, then you're gonna add something to that. So I, I find that not compliant with uh, D3 and significant features. Um, so then thinking again out loud, commissioners, do you, generally do you agree with me on that, that the angled one creates more problems? Yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Okay. So if we just talk about the flat, the flat surface to the roof, um, it has, you know, we, we use our, our skylight guideline because it's a visual change to a roofscape. <clears throat> um, and it, being flush is, is how we usually get around that. Someday we will be dealing with our guidelines and, and, and changing them to address these things. But right now, that's what we point to. So um, the visibility of these from the upper campus needs to be shown. And I would say if you wanted 
I'm not, you won't get the same bang for your buck in terms of energy efficiency. But if you only did it on the upper story, you probably are going to find they're not visible. But on the lower, the lower buildings, they are going to be visible. And um, or or you can show us that they're not. But you yeah, I think that's where our, our 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 struggle was as well in terms of of whether or not uh, needing to mask these or hide these when you're actually up in a, in a building of, of several stories um, played a role. Our, our current layout is, is, is attempting to eliminate um, in the flat panel system uh, any visibility from, from grade as you're standing on the ground and looking at, at the building around the campus. Yeah. Um, and because of those existing parapets, we believe we're, we are lower than, than a lot of those um, and even when we're elevated, um, our, didn't seem that we were able to see those rooftop conditions. Um, but as you say, in the white areas, we're, we're electing not to put, you know, panels sure. in those areas. Sure. I guess what you're hearing from us is we're skeptical that you would not see on the lower ones, at least from the upper campus, that you would not be aware that there are solar panels on the roof. But if they're consistent color and they're flat to the roof, it may not disrupt the design. It's basically a new roof. Um, and this is Roberta. Yep. Uh, Go for it, Roberta. <laughs> just just uh, to follow up on uh, <laughs> Now she's playing music. Yeah. Comment earlier that if the roof has to be replaced, uh, will it have to um, be elevated higher and therefore will the, a new roof makes the roof taller? Yeah. Yeah. Just something to research. Thank you. That's now, all one I'm thing saying. is we compare the solar panels to skylights. Usually when people put a skylight in, it's one, it's a space, it's one, it's a space, or it's just one hanging there. It's very apparent. Solar cells tend to go in large mass groups like this field. So if the entire roof is covered with solar panels, you may have what looks like sort of a, oh, a very plain plaid roof. Right. Black. Not, yeah. not Argyle, not anything bright, but it would be a pattern that's consistent across. Yeah. It, yes. I'm not sure it's be, if that is really as offensive of this one, these little boxes stuck all over the place that a skylight looks like. So just visually, yes. it makes a difference. All right, yeah, and when it's done badly, it's a jagged set of uh, angles. Yeah. So what, what I, to summarize then, um, I think that the, um, the angled ones, I do not believe the commissioners unanimously would consider them feasible. Um, the, uh, the flat panels, I think you have some work ahead of you to show the actual visual impact from the upper campus, including from upper stories of McDowell. Um, to, 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 get, to let us see the actual visual effect. Um, so not, not just from the pedestrian standing close to the building, but um, from above the building, uh, yeah. what, it, what it would look like. And, and some photographs of, of buildings like this with a flat roof that have a, a solid mass of, of flat solar panels. That's Things right. Like that would be really helpful to help us understand how this is going to look. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Are Thank there you. any pockets in this roof or wells where the um, angled solar panels could be placed that it wouldn't be seen. I'm looking at the back side along, what is it? St. John's Road. St. John's Street. Yeah, there are locations where the panel becomes high enough that we would not need to place a, um, place a screen wall to, to mask it from, from grade. We're not talking about, uh, oh. yeah, there, there we go. Uh, so there are certain areas yeah. where we do feel that the, uh, the parapet wall is is high or significantly high and that we so, could so those areas you would literally have to get above the building to see it 
I, I believe so, yes. Is that something we're considering? Well, that's a good point. Um, then we're getting to the concept of mixing angled and flat, which you haven't necessarily presented as an option. Uh, but again, this would help from the visibility from above at the higher campus. So perhaps, I, and again, I'm thinking out loud, um, but, but again, adding a parapet wall to me anywhere on, on this building. Um, but no, 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 we're not saying adding parapet. Uh, 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 the exist, like the top parapet. example. I got you, the yeah. top example. Top yes. left one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, parapet, the existing parapet is There you go, good circle. It yeah. has to hide it. Right. That, and that's on, the, that's on the second floor as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, if, if that allowed us to remove certain extents of the roof, um, yeah. so you see the extent of the flat is a lot greater. So if, for instance, some of this was visible from McDowell and we wanted to remove it, putting some angled panels on the south side might allow us to remove some of those and still get the same. That's, that's worth knowledge. pursuing. Is that something the yeah. commission would be open to? Pers personally, yeah. what, what does everyone else think? Well, as long as you didn't have big white spaces, you know, in between them. So, you know, what we're saying is they, uh, they, they need to be consistent. Right. Oops. You're cutting in and out a little bit. And not a lot of black. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, don't, okay. don't create a pattern that isn't rectangular in nature. If we are able to, um, and, and I know we, we are, so <laughs> if we provide you with photography from different vantage points and in Photoshop, we put the, the, the solar panels on those, would that be you know, an adequate response to some of your hesitation about what you are actually seeing? For me, I understand your, your concern. For me, it would. that's basically what I'm asking you for. For me, yes, mock-ups as much as possible. Yeah. Just to be clear as well, some of the arrays configuration as it's shown here is attempting to avoid the positioning of existing rooftop equipment as well as yes. provide maintenance paths and circulations. Sure. So if we're trying to uh, provide yeah. a uniform okay. appearance across the entire roof, it may not be possible in certain locations, which I suppose we could explore not using, but would a mix of, of seeing the original flat roof material as well as solar panels, is that something else that could be accepted? Okay. So I'm saying in, in some roofs we might, I mean, we've shown it here and some roofs are obviously not having solar panels. In other roofs, say the, the lower uh, single story uh, classroom addition, which you're seeing uh, north to south on this plan here, um, th that's actually has two tiers. If one tier had, if we were able to prove that one tier, it was not visible as your stand or, or, or we could ex expand out the solar panels to cover it. Whereas in the other tier, we do need to break it up. So maybe we just eliminate it completely. If that makes sense. I'm sorry. I'm hmm. thinking as I speak as well. <laughs> Jim, we're conformists. We want to see everything conform to a specific pattern. Yeah. That makes sense. So Cover it, okay. but don't cover it. Yeah. Yeah, right, with 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 acknowledging that you're going to need to notch around a, a HVAC a unit, exactly. um, but it should be completely rectangular in nature. Just as one silly little example in the left hand drawing, for whatever reason you didn't, continue, there's a notch. You got one row. There's a notch. As that maybe that's an HVAC unit. I don't know, but it isn't on the other drawing. So on the right hand. So the uniformity oh. of it is going. There you go. Um, we've all seen terrible solar panel installations, as you know. So, um, well, I, I yeah, we, we understand what you're you're saying. That I mean, yeah. it, it it works with the Neutra design of these very simple rectangular shapes. Of course, this is going to be the most beautiful design you'll never see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> perfect. You yeah. you completely get it. If um, we don't see it, it looks great. Well, I, I hate to bring up a point, but drone photography is becoming so prevalent in a historic district right now. It's being, it's crazy what we see when drone photography is used for tourism right now. You look at our roofscapes and they're awful <laughs> with HVAC. So someday this will be seen, promise. 
Um, so I guess to, to, again, to try to be clear on, on summarizing, if, if there is a, I'm looking at the left-hand drawing here, it looks like the opportunity for not building, the only place that exists, the existing parapet would mask the angle is along the St. John's Street side. Uh, so I'm not sure that's enough for you. It looks like you need a parapet on, or are you saying a new parapet wall would be needed on the campus side um, on the angled? Yeah, that's it. That's so that's understanding. Yeah, yeah, that, that it doesn't make it that option of mix and angled and flat as compelling. So you guys can decide that. I don't want to design for you, but. Right, yeah. got it. If you can find opportunities, then that. Or the seven degree angle. <laughs> Compromise. We're Excellent. really mixing and actually now. We're letting them do the design work. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for the, uh, the okay. assistance here. All right. Thanks. Um, so just now to summarize what Tammy, what Tammy does in terms of minutes for this, she'll summarize that hour long discussion very, very briefly. So Tammy, you don't have to go into all of that deliberation in, in the, the minutes, but I'll, I'll summarize now that, that um, there are three, um, three design aspects to this application. The first is on the St. John Street side which is the uh, replacement of the existing non-contributing uh, corrugated wall with two doors and a big opening uh, to be replaced with a curtain wall system and two entrance doors. The commissioners uniformly, unanimously believe that that is a feasible approach to um, uh, meet the needs of, of the applicant. Okay, that's one. Um, the second component is more complicated. So I'll step through it and let, let each of you, if I miss anything, but moving from the, um, the east side where there are, uh, is, the proposal is a curtain wall system. Um, the commissioners were not fully on one camp or the other regarding the feasibility of that. And we would uh, look for further uh, elaboration on the part of, of uh, the um, applicant to pre present options there to perhaps retain the existing doors or do a different treatment that acknowledges their presence. It, I guess that, that that's gonna be, remain up to the, the um, applicant to decide on that. On the north elevation, the curtain wall, uh, the idea of penetrating the curtain wall with two new exit doors onto the new um, patio or new um, terrace, it, it was not deemed feasible um, due to uh, the guidelines of, that we mentioned, D3, which was significant original features, and D5, which was, has to do with repair and replacement of original features. Um, the... Um, other door on the east elevation um, facing in the, in the new lobby. Again, the, the, the uh, commissioners were, uh, some commissioners uh, were open to the change of that door and others weren't. And so we will uh, take that up when we see the final application. But again, that feature um, it does, is not on a historic component of the building. Uh, we discussed the importance of maintaining the existing mountains on, on, uh, on, the, on the curtain wall as close as possible and look forward to detailed drawings regarding how uh, the new compliant uh, safety glass basically can stay as close as it can to the existing mountain profile. Um, that, that feature is extremely uh, character defining in, in this building. Um, Further, we would expect either in the full application or in another pre-application, details of the exterior terrace, all of the landscaping features, including plantings. Um, so I don't know whether you want to do that in another pre-app or whether you uh, um, want to just bring that to the eventual um, uh, application. I think what we would like to do is have a conversation with Roberta first okay. and see what right. her recommendation would be. That's fine. Um, 
So that has to do with materials and there's all sorts of guidelines for materials, plantings um, uh, that are, are relevant. It'll be an interesting design process because you certainly, again, we're not going to recommend brick walls with, <laughs> with bluestone caps like we would on the upper campus. Right. Um, so that, uh, did I miss anything on that component from other commissioners or Roberta? Okay. Um, regarding uh, no, the just, just that uh, they may, can you hear me okay? They, you would, they would want to develop the argument uh, for or against the issue of laminating film, just to, right. just to finish that argument out. Okay, okay. Thank you. All right, then the third component has to do with the solar panels on the roof. And there's a lot to do in terms of feasibility on this one right now. It's proposed neither of these, I believe, are completely considered feasible. The angled uh, option requires a modification to the rooftop in, in several places and therefore is considered uniformly among commissioners not feasible. Um, the flat uh, panel installation, it, it needs more development and we need more evidence that it is not going to be visible from the upper campus, including views from McDowell Hall. Uh, in, in, uh, and we discussed several options in terms of mixing and matching angled and, and flat, um, but it'll be up to the uh, applicant to come up with a final proposal there. It'll be important that they acknowledge the importance of simplicity and rectangularity in any design that's presented. And um, again, we're looking at our guidelines. D9 has to do with protection of all character of roofs and D3, which has to do with uh, significant original features uh, as our reason for feeling right now, this is not a feasible presentation the way it, it looks. Um, if okay. I might add some guidelines for consideration, um, yes, and, and as and as Tim stated earlier, um, they do supersede the sustainability guidelines. Um, we, as as the landscape develops, uh, as Tim stated, uh, we have guidelines C one, C two, C four. There's a whole C section there for yeah. landscape. Um, D1 is the Secretary of the Interior Standards and we do follow uh, for this project guideline one, two, three, four, five, six, nine, and 10. That those would be the Secretary of the Interior Standards. And then um, in addition to those mentioned, what has already been mentioned is D3, D5, D6, D16, D28, and D9 was uh, added in. Uh, we also have D4, preservation of historic alterations. Um, we use D12 skylights because we don't have one for solar. <laughs> Uh, D13, if any masonry work is done. Uh, mm. D17 for new openings. D29 for utilities. And D30 for lighting, which we haven't talked about at all. Yeah, that would be on that. Plan. And we can go over those further, Greg, in a, in a conversation that you say you want to follow up with. Yeah. All right. Um, have we provided you with uh, enough feedback? <laughs> Hopefully. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you very much and look forward to uh, further. You, you have a choice whether you want to come back for another pre-application or you can talk about that with Roberta or whether you great. want to go forward. It's up to you. Thank you all for your, your time. We really appreciate it. No, we appreciate Thank your you effort much. in presenting yeah. options Thank and research. You. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night, JR. <laughs> I saw you join. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I'm just, Tammy, one more thing. Do, do make 
I, I the client that this is not a big deal, but we didn't really discuss any masonry uh, uh, maintenance on the out exterior. We're going to want to see that as well. So, okay. Um, next on the agenda is market space uh, pre application. And who, uh, Dan Douglas? And who else? Uh, Jody Danik? <coughs> Jeremy Mr. Black. Chair, I have a I have a Chris Hannon in the attendees, but I do not see that as someone who was invited. Uh, is that someone I should promote? Um, Dan or Jody? Uh, who is this? Uh, what What's the name again? Chris Hannon is the name. Chris Hannon is uh, my business partner at McGarvey's. He wanted to join in and just listen in and see what uh, see what some thoughts were. Okay. So if, if you'd like to have him join, that's fine. Okay. Kevin, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Um, this is a pre-application for uh, market space. Uh, you heard me say this uh, if you tuned in earlier, uh, uh, that this is a pre-application, which we, uh, the Historic Preservation Commission grants to propose uh, future applicants as an opportunity to review uh, draft design and provide feedback regarding um, design guidelines and uh, compliance and potential feasibility. So uh, it is not intended to uh, be an approval or disapproval in any way and um, is not binding on, on the uh, HPC or the applicant shouldn't expect it to be an approval. So um, if who, who, who's leading the charge could, uh, agree that th that is understood, please? Yes, hi, Commission. Thank you for listening to us and hearing us on this pre-application. We appreciate your time. My name is Jody Danik. I'm a partner at the uh, Annapolis Market House. Can everybody hear me? Yes, and so Jody, if you're leading the charge, do you understand my statement and do you agree? Yes, sir, I do okay. understand and I agree. Okay, thank you. So. As we did, if you're leading the charge, um, tell, introduce your team, if you would, to us, and then tell us what you'd like us to know. Yes, so um, my name is Jody Danik. I'm a partner at the Annapolis uh, Market House. Tonight we have um, uh, Kevin Havens, who's a partner at um, McGarvey's Restaurant, and I believe Jeremy Black is on the call still. He's the uh, partner at Federal House. Our architect is uh, Dan Douglas. And so um, uh, basically we, uh, you know, we've gone through COVID. Um, <clears throat> we're hoping that it's almost near its end. And um, we're just thinking about how to better utilize the market square and the space. And, um, you know, we, we love the fact that the city has allowed us to have these recovery zones. We love the fact that we've been able to do outdoor dining, you know, without that and without the recovery zones, uh, many of us would probably be closed right now and um, out of business. And uh, that would not be a good look for downtown. So we know that the long-term um, uh, master plan with the uh, city dock action uh, committee is to create a flexible space at that market square for dining, for pedestrians, for community use, for visitors. And so, um, uh, and we also know that as it exists right now is not a very uh, um, attractive or uh, inviting um, uh, uh, representation of our city with uh, different umbrellas and different tents and different tables and different chairs. So we're basically just trying to get ahead of the game. We know that, um, you know, somewhere between three and four years from now or two to four years from now, um, there's calls to get that rebricked and to have dining out there. Um, and we are, um, we like what uh, having it closed now to traffic and we'd like to try to find a bridge and a solution to sort of bridge the time between um, the ultimate final decision of the, uh, and the design of the historic preservation and historic Annapolis and the city and all those stakeholders and um, the five restaurants that represent um, Market Square Group. And, and, you know, we're Annapolis Market House, Federal House, McGarvey's, Milton's Tavern, and Iron Rooster. And so we know we've, we have a lot of um, support from the, from the community, a lot of people 
uh, residents and city residents liked um, having that square closed. It's a unique square and, um, and uh, it's obviously a very important square for the city and, um, and for downtown Annapolis. So um, this is sort of our opening bid to sort of ask, you know, how do we bridge that gap and to look for solutions between the time um, between now and when the uh, city doc uh, action committee's final design is implemented with the city. And so we know, um, you know, the recovery zones aren't gonna be here forever, um, but we'd like to try and keep that area closed and keep it open and, and beautify it in some way. And I think the restaurants in that, um, those five restaurants are committed to um, beautifying it and, and, and putting some money towards it um, uh, as it as it grows. So, you know, we're looking for solutions and, and this is our first um, attempt at a solution and to see what you all think um, and uh, to try to figure out a solution of how we can work together towards that final goal three to four years from now when City Doc Master Plan is realized. Um, I guess with that, we can just show you, I know it's getting late. We'll just show you our design, let Dan go through it and um, good. Uh, see what you all think. So thank you. Thank you. All right, Dan, are you able to present? Yeah, thank you, Jody. Um, so the, the restaurateurs of markets, uh, market space came to me and asked uh, to ask me to design what would ultimately hopefully be a final product. Um, but for the moment will be, as Jody said, a bridge between the tents and the Jersey barriers that are there now and whatever the space becomes years from now uh, as part of the city doc master plan. And they were willing to invest in a little bit more ambitious design exploration and I enthusiastically took them up on that. So the result is what we're gonna show you now. And if we can see the first slide. Do, we, do you have the presentation ready to be shown. I can share no. my screen. Yes, actually, that's the way we do this. You, you, if you can share your screen, you should do. You should drive. Okay, let me figure out then. There we go. Great. All right. <clears throat> So this is the second the version we got this afternoon, correct? It's got fewer. That's right. Just to clarify, for the commissioners who may not have seen it came in. Okay. So Market Square will be a shaded leafy place for gathering and dining. That was one of two phrases I kept in my mind as I worked on this. And what we've got is basically a, a curb height deck uh, that takes the L of market space um, and we have an array of different types of, of seating for with space allotted for five restaurants so it's zoned out and we've got a corridor on that axis and a corridor on this axis and it looks like this so I was trying to I was trying to make it uh, very generously planted. I think the a lot of plants uh, has a great psychological effect as well as having a, an actual cooling effect. So I wanted it to feel have a garden feel to it. I wanted it to be. I wanted the system of construction to be modular. I wanted it panelized, expandable, and able to be built in phases. <clears throat> so I've got a system of four components of hubs, masts, framing panels, and decking. The wooden framing hubs incorporate heavy steel angles to support the masts. The masts would be built of fur and they're just built up from a, a core uh, fur four by four and then fur two by fours, 
uh, lag screw to it with square head lag bolts. And a cable system connects all of the masts together to provide stability and to provide a place to, to hang shading devices from. On, the, on each mast is mounted a couple of lights and a couple of uh, iron planters, plant, plant boxes. And together these, these hubs and masts and framing panels and the wires that connect the masts form the basic structural system of the whole setup. These, uh, the masts are laid out on a grid of 14 by 16 or 16 by 16. And they're built of panels A, B, and C, which are would be able to be built off site for the most part and trucked to the site as would the masts. So this could be built in a shop largely and assembled on site. The decking I would like to see as natural wood. Uh, there, were, there are issues of longevity of that to be considered. Some structural stability is provided by these fancy brackets. <laughs> and those brackets also help define spaces for individual vendors. And the last slide shows the sunshade devices, which would be built. They're only intended to be sun shading, not to keep, not for rain. And they would be uh, a loosely woven fabric uh, so that water would penetrate easily and so that wind would also <laughs> not tend to carry them as, as much. And the result is a warm, natural, welcoming space with two primary corridors that would be, they would replace essentially the, the sidewalks as the primary public avenue through this, through market space. And we've stretched it out to connect with Hopkins Plaza. And this space uh, would be, this is envisioned at this point as a public space, not allocated to any particular restaurant at this point. And this is simply a view from City Dock looking up toward Iron Rooster. So that's, that's the result of, uh, of design with the blessing of the restaurants to have free reign essentially. And it's a point, a uh, beginning point for a discussion that I'm sure will be spirited. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, I, we really appreciate your um, your design. Um, I do. I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll introduce this. Um, we, and I, I also understand that at this point, it, um, the desire to continue the activation of this space. I also want to acknowledge the fact you're coming to the HPC because we're kind of down the line um, in terms of uh, review. And um, the first thing I, I, would, I would, so I have a series of questions for you. Um, do you envision this as a, a design that would be relatively permanent for the next several years until, until potentially the city dock design would change it. Yes. Okay. So this is not temporary. It wouldn't come and go with the seasons. No. Or with festivals or anything. Okay. Um, so you have a lot of work ahead of you, even if even after tonight's discussion, in terms of allowing the city, the city permitting you to do this, closing off the streets and such. Have you had any feasibility discussions with, with them? The only feasibility discussion I've had is with the fire marshal. And what was it was was he? Um, what was his reaction? His reaction to closing Pinckney Street and to 
to closing the space between Middleton's and Market House, uh, boiled down to, we would obviously prefer that you not, but if there's a fire and the closest we can get is the corner of the Market House and Middleton's, that's where we'll fight the fire from. Uh, he didn't say no. Okay. And that, that was really, it was a brief conversation. Uh, he, he expressed a desire to keep 16 feet of lane. Um, if we, you know, if that, that's their preference, obviously, and that's not at all surprising. But he didn't say, I have no way to fight this fire if you close down that lane. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and and the residents on Pinckney Street, I uh, just <laughs> are, are 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 this would be a permanent closure for them for two two years, possibly three. Um, I assume that's that those discussions are underway, but that would be a concern. Um, uh, I'll, I'll let Jody handle that one. Yeah. So <clears throat> we have uh, had. Uh, multiple discussions and there are many residents on that street that are um, would like to see Pinckney Street um, closed permanently since they've had a little bit of a taste of it I think they've come around a lot and, um, and now they uh, they see the benefits to having that closed the the trash trucks the one issue that we have and and really this all this whole project sort of stemmed from hey, you know, we have these tents, we have these uh, different tables. We want to have a uniform, uh, better look, oh, no. mm -hmm. right? That's going to be able to um, uh, transfer from whatever the city ends up deciding and whenever it does end up deciding it. You know, that these things are, uh, they take a lot of time, right? So we want to have something that it was, um, uh, uh, in, in, in essence, a temporary nature that could come and go in case it had to. But that um, move towards, you know, each year we would add a little bit of, a, of an element there. And the big, big thing was um, the shading uh, and not being able to connect to all the different buildings, you know, with, um, with hooks or with especially Market House, because that's historic. So that's when Dan came up with the design idea for the posts yeah. that are incorporated into the deck, into the planters. Um, but we, we think the residents are behind this and we think um, Pinckney Street, they would be happy to see it this way. Um, you know, Fleet Street is still open and most people have been able to learn um, to go around and go up and around and down Fleet Street in order to go through that space. But ultimately, if you look at the city, this spot feels like it should be closed to pedestrians only. And this walkway that you come through is 12 feet wide. Um, and, you know, we envision hundreds of people walking through there and looking at different, uh -huh. you know, and deciding whether or not they want to sit in a cafe. And we see people, you know, maybe feeling a little bit more like they're in a European city sometimes, even though they're not. Yeah. But, um, but just one comment, not to be, but the other buildings around it are also historic. Um, and um, this is Annapolis and we already have uh, some standards and design guidelines. Mm -hmm. So, it, 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 and that's what we're trying to, um, to preserve. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the point of our guidelines and our design guidelines. So that's where we're gonna have a further discussion. I guess now we'll just uh, launch in, into that. Um, th this project has lots of components to it, which are covered in our current guidelines. Um, both that we have specific guidelines for um, cafes, outdoor cafes, uh, which include planters, furniture, lighting. And um, I, I, I'll just say that right now it is not in compliance with those particular guidelines. Um, that's my view, at least. Um, so we, we have to apply our guidelines to all applicants. So we can't, I completely applaud your, your design guide, your design vision. And I, I personally wouldn't, I think it would be interesting to close the streets, but we can't just um, unfortunately ignore our guidelines 
for a specific project uh, because then we'd have to ignore them for everybody. So we're in a tough position here. Great idea, very creative, seems nicely designed. But uh, that's, that's my view right now. And I'll ask other commissioners and, and Roberta to, uh, to state their view. Anyone? I won't, I can't really add anything in addition to what you've said, but I will say that that's, that pretty much sums it up for me. Um, we have a set of guidelines that we have to follow for, you know, for sidewalk furniture and, and outdoor areas such as this. And unfortunately this is, you know, completely out of those guidelines. And so, you know, we don't have a whole lot of flexibility here. Um, you know, I'm, I, I don't, I don't know as much as I would like to know about this, about this um, potential project in terms of, you know, is it removable? Is it, you know, or is it going to stay for the whole two years? You know, would we be able to see, you know, the drawings that I'm seeing here show that it may be obscuring the fronts of our beautiful historic buildings down there. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know enough about it, but um, unfortunately what I see here as I said, is not in compliance. But you know, if, if you guys do decide to move forward, we would need a lot more information. So I don't know if that's any help, but <laughs> Tim? Yes. Um, I'd like to start from a slightly different point, um, which I think you would both agree to, but if you disagree, please say so and correct me. Um, I think aesthetically and architecturally, um, I, I, I'm very much in favor of this. Uh, I really like it. I like the concept, but I, I have to agree with the chair and vice chair. It just seems to completely fly in the face of all the guidelines that we are obligated by law and by our oath to uphold. So it, it's a non-starter. For me. Okay, Bill? I've been trying to think what to say. I, <laughs> I like the design, but I'm not sure that's the place, especially as a semi permanent um, system. Yeah, I, I could see it coming out for a festival. Yeah. At yeah. A, a special event, even if that festival or event went on for a week or two. But, um, every day, all year round. I think it would get more pushback than, um, if not from the immediate residents, many others. Because I do know from what I've heard of from many people, they're tired of some of these cafes poking out into the streets. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of bigger issues about, you know, uh, whether the streets are public property and they should be assigned to the use of private uh, businesses as this would. Um, but that's something that's uh, just beyond the scope of right. what we're mm -hmm. responsible yeah. for. No, okay. Okay. <clears throat> I can consider, but I'd like, to, I would like to say that I think this kind of thing is very much like what we recently said we would uh, consider, would approve over on Maryland Avenue, but this is much bigger. It's more permanent, even if it's not meant to be permanent in the sense of decades and decades. Yeah, you know, but there's just a lot of things that I think take it too far beyond what we're able to actually yeah. prove given our guidelines. Yeah, Maryland Avenue is a temporary yeah. event. It's an art, that's an yeah, art installation. Yeah, that's that's art. And it doesn't interfere with what is the normal pattern over there. Yeah. yeah. This, which this current situation has interfered with the normal pattern in this area, yeah. but this takes it a step further into the permanent zone. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it does reflect uh, that, that our, our guidelines, uh, again, which talk about planters and lighting and, for, and even talk about umbrellas or umbrellas under the, um, under the canopy here. And, um, I think Bobby raises a good point of one of our key guidelines besides that, any alteration which uh, 
obscures the historic nature of a facade is not compliant. Um, and this one, you can even see in these drawings, it, it clearly does that. So um, I don't see how it could be feasible. Um, I'll give Kim one more chance and then <laughs> we have to work with her technology. Kim, can you hear me? Can you? Uh... Oh, well. We'll, we'll so if I could just... Um, Go ahead, Jody. Moment. Uh, obviously, this is a radical departure from downtown Annapolis at this, at this stage. Um, however, in the master plan, it does call for a bricked over um, uh, plaza-like area that's used for dining uh, and for pedestrian access. And so ultimately we see this space as not being used for cars or have, having the ability to open and close. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're not, this is a dream design in my mind. I'd love to have it in the back of my yard, right? Um, but all of us, but um, we're not so hung up necessarily in the design as much as the ability to be able to incorporate this space in a pedestrian way that um, reduces uh, automobile traffic and um, uses this space as sort of a center of town space. And so if it, you know, if, if the tables and chairs had to be um, all uniform according to Historic Preservation Commission standards, Historic Annapolis standards, and, you know, there's lots of options with that, but we would, we would have a uniform chair, we would have a uniform table, we'd have uniform planners that were approved, that previously were approved. Um, but, but sort of the concept of this being um, closed to traffic, city approval pending, obviously, um, is just something that we wanted to start with Historic Preservation Commission so that, I mean, obviously you're, you guys are the heavy hitters and, you know, you you all make the, make the decisions on some of this stuff. So, you know, we just wanted to throw it out there. In, in the master yeah. plan, it is closed to automobile yeah. traffic and it has flexible bricked over space. Yeah. Um, we would be happy with all of that. We just wanted to see how um, amenable the commission was to showing us a way to bridge between now and then. Because once yeah. it's lost, it's, it's lost again. Um, and it would be a shame to see that space lost um, to, to cars. I think yeah. we could all agree. Tim, Tim, can well, I Yeah, I appreciate your car, yes. Well, sure, well, uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I just, like, I just actually want to say, it's, it's nice of you to call us the heavy hitters, Jody, but yeah. we, we don't determine anything <laughs> about opening and closing of streets. So yeah. well, go ahead, Will. Thank you. Um, as a member of the City Dock Action Committee, um, uh, Jody's, of course, quite right. We're trying to expand pedestrian access and usability. Um, and in that sense, I also support this. Um, but the, the bind is, as a citizen wanting to support you as business people in a difficult time uh, and bridge this gap of time where things are in flux. Um, and so what I would say to you is, try to work more closely with the, um, the, the new iteration of the action committee for the city dock, because I think you're on the right track, but, right. Uh, and, and if you modified some of the things about the consistency with our existing standards for planners and street furniture and umbrellas and, and such, you might be able to develop this in a way that we would consider, but it's just right now, today, I don't think it works. I hear what you're saying, Will. I, and I appreciate that because um, that gives us some hope that we can work with all the other stakeholders to try to, I mean, it, you know, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be some time before this space right. is developed and, and, and we don't know how much time, but you know, three years, maybe, maybe less if we're lucky, maybe more. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and so finding a bridge that each year we could kind of step a little closer to the final design, how, however the city dock action committee, um, you know, decided that's, that's all we're looking for. We just don't, you know, probably the recovery zone will end maybe um, 
sometime in the fall. Uh, you know, maybe we'll have till winter, but but by next spring, we would we would like to be involved in some design elements to be able to try to reopen this somehow. And and I guess we'll have to work with the new iteration of the city doc action committee and as well as the city. But I know yeah. I believe the city does see this, in, and there have been residents that want to see this um, close to traffic. So mm -hmm. at least on a some sort of basis, temporary. Sure. Oh, I, I would say that I, as a citizen, as a member of the um, action committee, would want to see it closed or at least made um, accessible only to emergency vehicles and maybe done like bicycles or something. I, you know, but that's yeah. that's a whole other discussion. Yes. Well, I, I think, Jody, you're on the right. To me, you're on the right track. This is a step-by-step -step proposal. Yeah. We can look at step one in the near future. Um, that, that's, that's a reasonable approach. Um, we, we do need you to look, though, at the guidelines, which actually don't allow planters right now or partitions. So if you start working with what we can do now, and we can work together over the next few years, I, I think that, that would be a way forward if you can convince the city to close the street or if the city decides to close the streets. Um, so this is Roberta. Hi, Roberta. Um, and I, I think we all have to, and hi, we have, I think we all have to agree that um, this much cleaner look is better than Jersey barricades and uh, yes. beer signs or hallelujah uh, i completely agree with that individual it's very classy it is yeah um, nice and yes it is and uh i just came back from williamsburg which had a which has um it's um duke of gloucester street uh a very uh clean look like this with um all of the features the same. Throw this out again, which really doesn't relate as much to historic preservation as it does to city council. And that is when I had talked to this very, uh, with uh, Eric Evans very briefly, I had said, is there not something between um, the zoning of recovery zones and permanent zoning? So in other words, is there not a different temporary that can be established um, that is a little bit longer. So right now your recovery zones have to be um, reversed back to uh, the pre-existing within 30 days, correct? Um, yeah. Of the governor lifting the order. And so my question was, is, is there not a uh, another temporary designation that can be made and then within our existing guidelines, can something be created? Now, I did have a, a conversation today with the fire marshal who does still have uh, concerns, but um, as Dan says, he, did, he wasn't throwing this out entirely, but he, he does have um, issues of access that I think you could work with. Um, so I think, I think one of your hurdles is uh, perhaps city council and another one of your hurdles is the office of law because uh, uh, using city space and who, who pays for the use of that space. So um, I would suggest as others have said, um, taking a look at the guidelines we've got, assuming you know, that those aren't going to change in the next year um, and what you can do within those guidelines um, and how much can be more of a, uh, as you're, call, you're calling it a bridge and it is a bridge, but um, it almost seems like you need a resolution of some sort from city council to make that bridge. Um, and, then, and then we established guidelines or zoning established guidelines for the tents over the winter time, which did seem to help somewhat with uh, creating more uniformity and less signage. Um, 
So that's another avenue to pursue. But as the commission members have said, it still has to fall within current guidelines. You know, as lovely as this is, it still has to fall within current guidelines. And then I would also suggest, so we can meet about that to see, you know, how it could be adjusted to meet current guidelines. Um, uh, and then I would also suggest um, having a meeting with, that includes uh, public works, zoning, fire, law, you know, it sounds like a pretty big meeting, but we have these pre-application meetings as you're aware, that include several departments when um, a new concept is being proposed. Uh, so I would suggest getting more people around the table to discuss that. But I, I guess the bottom line for my little speech here is that um, uh, I personally, it doesn't, and it doesn't sound like the commission, wants to say, just forget it. Uh, that we'd like to figure and help you figure out a way to make it work. Does that help? That really does help because um, yeah. that's um, that I think is enough that um, uh, you know one of the um, reservations was um, nobody in the city wanted to make a delineation as to whether this could become a permanent space closed until um, and so they wanted to do it by recovery zones and maybe year by year by year, which is great. Um, but I think um, ultimately this, this space is designated to be ripped up, new public works, a lot of construction needs to go on, new, new um, I think drainage pipes and, and bricking of the space. So nobody wanted to put a, a significant amount of money into it unless it was gonna be there for a little while so we know that mm -hmm. in a yeah. couple of years it's going to be a lot of construction zone so um but i think being able to work with um you giving us hope that possibly we can work within the hpc guidelines um is gonna give a lot of hope to the residents and to the um restaurant tours that want to see this happen because yeah. i just think it's a great space and it's going to be the you know it is the center of town so um yeah and with all the other beautification going on, it's going to really make our, our city awesome. Yeah. Um, two more things. One, I, I, I don't want to give you too much hope <laughs> when you read Oops. what you do, what you need with, with this design that you presented. Of course. Okay. Um, but because there's a specific section in the, in the cafe guidelines called structural enclosures. And so you would need to remove many components here to do that. It says, you know, for instance, there shall be no overhead structural enclosure. So unfortunately that, that means the overhead may need to go currently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, nothing should be enclosed by planters, barriers, railings. So the, the planters you show here that separate the spaces, unfortunately are specifically not allowed. So a lot of things would need to come out of this design, but some of it could stay. So I guess what we're saying is if you start removing things that aren't compliant right now, we can continue the discussion. Um, it, it also happens to say that no covering of sidewalks uh, is allowed, um, would not to mention covering of the street itself. Um, also, Dan mentioned wood. It would, be, it would need to be wood. This could not be tracks in order for it to be compliant with other things. So that's, that's, I, I don't want to give you too much hope for this design. But the idea of organizing the space and making it better looking compared to what we have now is certainly supported by us, by, by me. I don't think that we're uh, committed necessarily to any design other than the one the city finalizes and, and decides. Yeah. We just want to be a part of it. And, and sure. have the space closed is ultimately our goal. And to have a uniform, better looking space that's inviting yes. residents. Yep. And yep. Yeah. Yes. Um, I also, one other thing, we did get some public comment on this from Karen Brown at Historic Annapolis. So I, I should read that to you if you didn't get a chance. It, 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 so it's in the record. Please. Um, uh, Historic Annapolis is sympathetic towards the restaurateur's desire to outdoor seating options. We also support the desire to improve 
the temporary alfresco dining arrangement that's in place now and, and was established in response to the COVID pandemic. We believe that open air dining experience helps activate the streets and can contribute to a vibrant, healthy downtown. However, HA has been part of the multi-year community-based planning effort, which culminated in the City Dock Action Committee consensus plan. The city has hired a consortium to carry out this plan, which envisions a renewed city dock, city dock, which is greener, more resilient, and more welcoming. Market Square is included in that project area and as an essential component to the broader project. The, consortium vision, ugh, the consortium's vision includes flexible use space to serve a variety of purposes in a united cohesive brand and image. The concept that's being proposed in the pre-application seems premature and doesn't appear to reflect the larger effort that's being championed uh, by the city through the CDAC implementation team. As the city stated in their briefing to downtown business community last month, economic development opportunities are an important part of the broader CDAC effort. The final design should reflect a united concept championed by the full business community along Dock Street, Market Square, and Lower Main Street. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, so that kind of summarizes some of what we, we just said too. I, I think the encouragement and, to work with them. And I don't disagree with that statement at all. I, I, I would agree with that statement. So um, I, I think um, finding a bridge between the recovery zones or some sort of permitting that allows these sort of outdoor open air alfresco dining experiences, um, maybe that's something that um, we can address with the city council and they can find a solution because yeah. this isn't the only space that's going to want to try to beautify it. You know? Absolutely. So. I think that's, an, that's important. Anything we decide here from a, a construction or a um, application point of view, will those standards will need to apply all the way up Main Street, even on West Street. I hear you. Um, and out to, the, out to the dock, we can't create, a, as I said from the top, we can't have different um, guidelines for different applications, so. Uh, this is Roberta, just, just as an FYI to the commission, maybe I should have said this in the announcements that there is a, a meeting, uh, an internal meeting this week um, to discuss uh, the re request for permanent parklets on Main Street. Parklets? Yeah. Are those bump outs? <laughs> yes. Okay. Just, Interesting. Well, that's part of the so same discussion, you know. This is this is the same issue. Mm-hmm. Okay. I would I'd like, say I'd like to comment if I can. Of course. I'm, yeah. Uh, the the critiques tonight have been all have been based on compliance with the regulations for sidewalk cafes. <clears throat> Whatever is uh, proposed and whatever is built um, for this larger space, this L between these five restaurants, is it is it correct and fair to judge whatever is proposed at, it, by categorizing it as a sidewalk cafe? I I don't think of what any proposal in this space as being a sidewalk cafe. I think of it as being a, <clears throat> a quasi public space, uh, a public square. Um, it, I, I, I think to, to judge it as simply a sidewalk cafe is a, a very narrow approach and probably not in my mind, the correct categorization for what this space will eventually be. Well, that's an interesting. How, how would you categorize it? What would you propose it as? Um, well, it appears to be a sidewalk cafe. <laughs> it's outdoor dining. Um, it is. It's, but, also, it's a good point, it, Dan. I mean, it's a good it, point. It's a, it's a quasi public space, but it's not just for you. It's not for use strictly by the public. I, I haven't thought about the right terminology to characterize it. Uh, but the rules for sidewalk cafes, I think that's pretty clearly aimed at really a sidewalk cafe, a, a small, you know, parklet sized uh, installation 
temporary, um, literally on the sidewalk. Yeah. So the the rules about uh, planters are not allowed. Well, that's because they block a sidewalk, and that's I, I understand why planters would not be allowed, but that's the sort of that's that's what I mean when I say it, is it fair to apply rules that are really meant truly for a sidewalk cafe to a much larger uh, a much larger space for a much larger program than a sidewalk cafe. That's that I may take your point. Um, I would say there are, there are just besides the sidewalk cafe furniture guidelines, we have also discussed other other issues uh, about obscuring historic fabric and uh, historic buildings. So that's if, if, if that alone that that I, I think we've discussed that there's compliance issues with that guideline alone. Um, so that's one way I, I would approach that. It's still, unfortunately, is not a feasible project project from the broader guidelines. The more, you know, that happens to be earlier is not in the sidewalk cafe, but you raise a point. Is there any way this can be considered landscape? Because if this was someone's backyard, all of this would be allowed. Well, if it was in their backyard, it wouldn't be obscuring historic structures yeah, that's that part is true uh, if this was moved towards the middle as opposed to either side um, can it be considered more along the guideline of landscape i think we can have that discussion it, we really didn't it's a valid discussion to have mm. Do you get and and then do you get what you need from it? If we look at um, our landscape, that we have all of our landscape C seven, C eight landscape planners, which really we don't want to go to <laughs> plants, sidewalk paving materials. I think street furniture is C twelve. So there's a whole series of landscape design that don't relate to sidewalk cafes that would need to be considered. I'm just scanning them right now. Yeah, street well, furniture is C12. And this would certainly, I think you would agree, Dan, this has to do with street furniture, which is what we use for the city when they want to put new uh, bollards or new trash receptacles or benches in. Um, yes, this is, this is street furnishing, yes. Yes. So a broader question. <clears throat> Um, in the immediate future, what is an approvable alternative to red and or orange and white jersey barriers and event tents? That's for you. Unfortunately, that's not for the commission to to tell you. You're, you're we, the onus is on the applicant actually to create approvable. So if you look at it as not a sidewalk cafe, look at things like guideline C12, look at um, the landscape aspects and that, that will guide you to, towards the design. But unfortunately we, we can't tell you what to design. Can you tell me a, a little more about the category of guidelines you're talking about? I don't know what C12 is. It, it's okay. I can. Okay. Tim, yes, Tim, I, I don't mean to be uh, interrupt anybody and it's a very good discussion, but it's not our place to address these issues. I think that's why we have the capable staff. We do. Yes. It is true. a little late. Okay. So Dan, Dan, I think Dan and I can talk about um, all of the C yeah. guidelines. Yeah. All of C. And, yeah. uh, and, and then I also suggest um, if you were using the C guidelines to have a, a larger, what I was describing, like pre-application meeting uh, with the other departments. Yeah, and I then, think that's and valid. Then come back, and yeah. then come back yeah. to the commission with a um, different proposal. Yeah, 
I think that's really important because regardless of what we say, if the city, if public works will not turn the, the street over to you, we've wasted our time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And you've wasted design time, which you really, we really don't want you to do. We appreciate your time tonight. We'll, we'll work uh, closer with the city and right. try to come up with a, a design that's uh, a little bit closer to the HBC guide. Um, but we we do envision this space being closed and we'll we'd love to meet with you um, since you were a member of the city doc action committee and just talk a little bit more about how you see this space being closed and used in the future if that's uh, possible well, as a commissioner he really couldn't discuss that with you. okay <laughs> well, well let, let me ask for a point of clarification on that because I'm happy to talk with anybody yeah. like Jody uh, and I would interpreted it as being uh, okay as long as he wasn't presenting me with a new proposal or anything like that um you know there's it's a it's a gray and fuzzy area so uh, mr yeah. chair provide me with some uh, guidance in an abundance of caution if it's going to eventually become an application to us we really shouldn't be discussing outside they should be discussing with roberta and if you i hear that, you that, yeah i think that this is clearly a work in process, progress yeah. yeah, I'm so, afraid that is probably the way I ought to go, Judy. Okay, I appreciate it. We know this is going to take some time and take some effort. Yeah. Um, hopefully we'll it won't take it. Some years. <laughs> anything, is better, anything is better than what we got. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. We're all on the same page there, that's for sure. That's for so, sure. Thank all you. Right. Well, thank you for your creative thank approach. You, all right, thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Um, Tim, did you summarize? I'm sorry. Oh, Thank you, Tammy. Um, regarding the uh, design for uh, outdoor dining in the market space, the commissioners discussed uh, issues uh, that have to do with compliance with the current guidelines, mainly having to do with outdoor furniture and cafe guidelines, uh, but also having to do with uh, guidelines regarding uh, obscuring historic buildings with the current design as presented and also uh, compliance with the landscape uh, guidelines, mostly in the C category, especially C12, which is street furniture. Um, so at this point, the design as it's presented is not the, the commissioners unanimously agree. It's not feasible as presented. Um, nonetheless, um, the concept of a, a, a different design, which does uh, can be presented, um, it, it is encouraged because we are definitely a, support the idea of improved consistency along uh, all along Main Street and City Dock. Um, the next step is actually proposed by Roberta is to get a broader technical committee together with other city departments to determine the feasibility of. Uh, anything going on in the street there in the short term. Okay. So thank you. And um, we'll keep working on it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I've lost my agenda. No idea where it is. <laughs> but I think any other administrative business is the only thing left on the agenda. Right. Um, the only thing I would um, mention um, is that our earlier discussion about guidelines uh, and regarding umbrellas has kind of been now superseded by this discussion we just had. So I, I would defer any further changes until we have a further discussion of that. And I actually would look forward to a, a broader look at this uh, that would go to city council for approval. The prior guidelines did go to city council for approval. So, but that's a long-term project. That's it. Okay. Any other business for any, any thoughts? Okay. Um, we do have an administrative meeting later this month. Um, so look for that agenda coming out soon. Three hours. Yeah. Do you need a motion? Motion to adjourn. So moved. So seconded. 
All in favor? Aye. Abstain? Approve, uh, deny, whatever it is. <laughs> All right. 